Okay, so if we take a seat, we we will start. Thank you. Okay, a very, very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming in a snowy day, the first snowy day in London today. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all in the beautiful premises of the Italian Cultural Institute in London. And please, Please take a little time to have a good look at the photographs that we are currently exhibiting on our walls. Uh, it's a beautiful exhibition and they are the last images of Pier Paolo Pasolini uh, currently hanging on our walls here and upstairs. Uh, I'm particularly delighted and particularly honored to host the annual initiative of ISUC, the August Association of Italian Scientists in the UK, in collaboration with AMBIT, and our institute. A big vote of thanks to Roberto Buizza, the scientific attaché to the Italian Embassy in London, for putting together this roster of very illustrious speakers and bringing this event to fruition. The theme is a very compelling one, and the title is a very compelling one, Science and Society in a Time of Crisis. And I think this title perfectly describes the predicament of our times. The conference will be followed by no less than two important award-giving ceremonies, presided over by our own ambassador. Uh, the first one, Italy Made Me 2022, and Il Circolo Science Award. These awards perform an extremely important function in support of promising young scientists and early career researchers. So it is my greatest pleasure now to give the floor to Roberto Buizza, scientific attaché to the Italian Embassy. Grazie, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katia. Welcome to everyone. Welcome, Professoressa Messa, former Minister of Research and University in the uh, Governo Draghi. So I want to thank you all and thank you, Isaac. Uh, the Association of Italian Scientists in the UK has put together this program and has contacted the people and they've done a lot of work to, to make it possible. So uh, after me, I will give the floor to Carla Molteni, the president of Isaac, to uh, say a few words about Isaac. And I just want to describe a little bit what's going to happen today. So we have a first, uh, sp uh, let me call it space, where we will have a... Uh, Professoressa Cristina Messa talking about um, uh, the Italy's program of reforms and investments for potential impact on research and education. And uh, she will then dialogue with Andrea Ferrari from the uh, University of Cambridge. Then after this, uh, uh, we will have three talks of three um, distinguished Italian scientists and literate persons who are contributed to pass a message that in Italy we do also a lot of high-level science and research. So we will have after this so Simonetta Agnello Hornby, Italian novelist and, uh, and a former solicitor who worked a lot for legal aid specialized in domestic violence. Then we have Pietro Lio from Cambridge University who works at the Department of Computer Science and Technology on Artificial Intelligence. And finally, Gianpaolo Balsamo from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, who is going to talk about uh, monitoring and modeling carbon emissions. This will be space number two. We will conclude this at around 4.45. Then we will have uh, 15 minutes to half an hour break. And at 5.15, we will have a ceremony of war with the ambassador. Um, to the seven winners, followed by uh, short talks by each of the winners who are going to tell us something about their research. Okay, so this is the plan for today. I hope you find it interesting to get a feeling of what's happening uh, among Italian scientists and, and, uh, uh, and academics. Uh, so it's my pleasure to 
first give the floor to Carla Monteni, who will tell you something about ISOC, and then we move to the first event. So, Carla. Good afternoon. Uh, um, I'm Carla Molteni. I'm here as a president of uh, ISUC, which is the Association of Italian Scientists in the UK. ISUC uh, uh, has been active since 2015, uh, and uh, the goal is to bring together the Italian scientists and researchers uh, who work uh, in the United Kingdom and uh, the um, academic uh, community uh, in the, um, of Italian, uh, actually, staff members of, uh, uh, in uh, UK universities, actually the larger uh, community of foreign scientists uh, and uh, researchers uh, in uh, the UK. Um, and uh, we do a number of um, activities, uh, in particular some uh, events uh, like uh, this one that uh, we co-organize with the embassy and uh, with the um, Italian Cultural Institute, um, and also some networking uh, events. And also uh, lately we have been connecting uh, with uh, the Association of uh, European uh, Researchers uh, in, uh, in the UK to have a sort of common uh, program. Uh, and, um, and so this is actually a new initiative uh, that uh, we're going to uh, carry on uh, um, more in the future. And so welcome again. And um, now we start with the program. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. So let me uh, open the presentation and... Uh... Okay, so I want to welcome uh, Professor Cristina Messa from uh, Università Bicocca of Milano. She was the, the rettore, the rettrice of the university for five years, then she went in the last 18 months to be a minister for research and education at the, uh, between February 2021 and, and just a month ago. So, um, Minister Messa, ex former Minister Messa, please, uh, the floor is yours. I, I think maybe best is if you sit there, yes, uh, and you can scroll up and down. And then, uh, Andrea, I'll leave you. You come over when you find it. Uh, when, when you think it's, it's right. Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here for many different things and reasons. Certainly one of the most important reasons is that this is a very good chance to meet uh, Italian researchers in UK. Most of us have been retired Italian researchers in this country. This country has always been a model for research and it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I tried when I was a minister to uh, attract, again, uh, researchers in Italy. That was probably the main purpose I had. But at the same time, I had the chance uh, of combining uh, reforms uh, and investments uh, thanks uh, to the recovery plan. So what I'm going to talk to you about briefly uh, is the sense of the recovery fund. Why we, de we decided uh, to invest in that way and why uh, we... Uh, um, took care mainly of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, reforming, of, uh, of uh, being able uh, to uh, um, examine the gap that Italy has in research uh, and uh, try to fill that gap. So, um, as you know, um, the recovery plan is a political European commitment, and the commitment is that of uh, pulling research that are adequate with respect, respect to the critical mass. This is a very important thing, particularly in Italy, where uh, many very good uh, uh, performances are done individually, and it's very difficult to find uh, a critical mass. To grow both in terms of human capital and research infrastructures, because those two uh, uh, parts of research have to go uh, together, and also to increase the competitiveness uh, of the Italian research environment uh, at the European and international level, and also to be able uh, uh, to define uh, the link between research and economy because this, and business, let's say, because this is uh, something uh, that we know is particularly weak in Italy. 
Uh, as you know, Italy has been granted uh, the most amount of uh, the recovery, uh, next generation EU, let's call it this way, uh, uh, funding. Uh, and uh, uh, the plan has been uh, developed in six missions uh, as uh, uh, in a sharing uh, a transversal strategic plan that is digitization and innovation, ecological transition and social inclusion. Out of those six missions, mission number four has been dedicated to uh, education and research. And this is uh, something uh, unusual because in many other countries this didn't happen. So it's something uh, that has been decided actually by the previous uh, minister, not, not uh, ourselves, but that was already there when we arrived. And that is uh, uh, about 30 billion euros. Mission four has uh, these uh, two different components. One component is from nurseries to universities, so it involves mainly schools, but also it has part uh, for universities, uh, whereby um, uh, uh, the most investment is done uh, on students, their rights to study, their uh, the residences, the problem, you know, of uh, uh, the cost for, of uh, universities, uh, and so these are uh, student housing, uh, scholarships uh, for good students, but also some uh, investment has been done on uh, teaching and advanced university skills, uh, because it is another uh, uh, very important uh, key issues, and the extensions on PhD programs. What we really did uh, was to uh, invest a lot on PhDs. In Italy, there are about 9,000 million PhDs every year. With the program, we will go up to 20,000. And I think this is very important, particularly if you want to recruit researchers, because uh, uh, nowadays uh, the, that uh, I increased a lot of the uh, possibility of, for universities and research centers to recruit people, it's difficult to find people. So uh, it's something that we have to reconstruct the base of research through the PhD program. The second component is the most important one in terms of money, and uh, it goes from research to business. So uh, it's about uh, 9 billion euros, and uh, six of these billions have been uh, invested in these big uh, uh, centers that should provide the research, but also transfer of research into the market, uh, into the uh, having an uh, economical impact. Um, so. I don't know whether you, you see the, oh yes, the arrow. Uh, so you have uh, uh, the typical research, the national research program, uh, that is uh, 1.8 billion euros. The investment for young researchers, uh, that is uh, particularly interest for uh, people who would like to come back to Italy, for example, 600,000 uh, million. And then you have these four, extended partnership, national champions, uh, innovation ecosystems, uh, that are uh, these big, big projects, uh, and uh, research infrastructure and industrial doctorates. So I don't want to go into details because it, it gets boring, but I want to show you that uh, two main important things. The first one, this is uh, divided in a quarter, you know, the, the, the deadline we have uh, up to 2021, then uh, the two deadlines of 2022. And what you can see here is that uh, uh, some of the, um, uh, actually the, 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 the work that we did uh, was about reforms, uh, not about uh, researches, but reforms of uh, PhD programs so that uh, it gets easier to do PhDs uh, without having too many rules like it was before. Uh, and in particular, it is possible to uh, have different partners. So the university can have partners outside universities, such as uh, industries, and they can share the research of their students, uh, uh, depending on the program they have. And so it gets much easier in this way. Also, we try to simplify. Simplification is one of the most you know, difficult things, actually. Everybody would like to simplify. Uh, but uh, that is, uh, it requires something particular that I did not understand what it is yet. But uh, we try to uh, do our best. And then uh, the other uh, that you see here are investments on uh, 
on uh, research, uh, on uh, housing, uh, and on fellowships. The most important uh, investment we did is actually what we finished uh, uh, in six months' time. So we were able to do the, uh, the line guidelines uh, on how to spend this money. Uh, in, uh, and that was, uh, let's say, November, December last year, to go up with the calls uh, on December and to assign uh, the winners uh, uh, by June 2022. In six months, we were able to do that. And it's important that you remember this because this has something to do with project uh, evaluation that uh, Piero should have been uh, able, to, uh, Piero Baglioni, to talk to you about, but I will say something about it. So in six months, we were able to assign uh, this very important amount of money to external, uh, extended partnership, which is, uh, um, let's say, uh, basic research, but done together between academy uh, research centers and industry. Uh, and these are uh, uh, about uh, 14. Uh, the in, uh, eco ecosystem of innovation uh, that are more territorial. So there are, uh, they, they include uh, uh, mainly regions of Italy and uh, again uh, are uh, a partnership uh, between private and, and uh, public sectors uh, working on specific area. The national centers, uh, those were centered uh, done on a key um, enabling technology specific that were decided by the ministry and uh, uh, the, infra uh, the research infrastructures. Other than this, however, we did again a one, another important reform, uh, that is the reform on mobility. Uh, that means that uh, depending on the program you have between, uh, let's say, an, an university and an industry, the people who are working in that program, they can move uh, from uh, one, uh, uh, from university to, to industry and vice versa for five years uh, without losing uh, their careers uh, and, uh, and the salary and whatever. And, they, and this is... Uh, to exchange uh, really uh, the researcher amongst the different centers. And the other uh, mobility we created is the mobility between uh, different public sectors of the research, so university and, and uh, research centers, uh, but also you know that we have the research hospital, let's call it this way, this way you know, Instituto Ricovere Cura Carattere Scientifico. And so you can exchange people that uh, are a similar, have a similar uh, seniorship uh, between these different uh, centers. Uh, this is a very important reform that still has to be uh, the effect on, uh, on the system because the system goes lower than the reforms in this way, in some way, but it will certainly, it, it, it gives the possibility to work in a different way. And finally, uh, we uh, are finishing now, actually, the new minister uh, uh, has already closed also the other program that were our deadlines for end of this year. And here I want to show you two reforms again that are not research only, but very related to research because they are important for the recruitment of researchers and for the education of our students. One is the reforms on the degree classes. You know, Italy has this crazy thing of having a very small and different, uh, we call it settori scientifico disciplinari, disciplinary sector that are very thin and let's say they are not actual at all. They are absolutely linked to some ages ago. Um, so that is the most difficult thing to change because a professor are used to that and uh, they don't know, they didn't give an, an alternative. So if you don't have, do not have the professor with you, you can't change this. But uh, we did, the we gave, again gave the possibility, there is a law now that says uh, that we have to create new groups of uh, uh, categories uh, of, uh, that should, be, should relate better research with teaching. Because uh, also there is this mismatch between the research, uh, like the ERC classification, and the teaching. That is another thing again. So they should re reunify this uh, system uh, in order to be able to recruit also the professor in a different way. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we did the reform to habilitate people, um, our students, uh, directly to the profession. For example, if you want to be a medical doctor, you don't have to do the, um, the 
staging uh, after the degree, but you can do it during the during your courses, and so that uh, really um, uh, shorten the, the time uh, of education. Um, all of this was done respecting the horizontal aspect. These are uh, the sustainable and digital growth, as you know, uh, the inclusive growth, uh, and this is important for the territorial divided. You know that Italy decided to, uh, uh, to give uh, at least 40% of investment in the regions of the south of Italy, the four regions of the south of Italy. Uh, the generation gap, uh, which is very important for universities because uh, the Italian university uh, teachers uh, are uh, older than uh, in other uh, countries, uh, in Europe and outside Europe, and the gender, of course. Gender is always uh, uh, a big issue. Uh, dynamic growth, so uh, we try to uh, have uh, this partnership uh, that are not only partnership, let's say, that we finance the private uh, to do research, but the private... Uh, uh, finance himself uh, to be on the, at the table of the research, to be there, to be there discussing uh, the aims, uh, discussing the results, uh, and having, uh, let's say, the priority of uh, having the access uh, uh, to the results. And then to, the, to develop the competence uh, centers, uh, uh, particularly devoted uh, to human capital uh, um, mobility. Uh, I go, uh, uh, let's say I skip this, uh, except for the fact that uh, um, to invest a lot in competencies, this is another gap we have, uh, particularly digital, but not only, don't, not only digital competencies, many of those, uh, and uh, the opportunities for PhDs, uh, as I told you before. Uh, for research, uh, again, uh, simplification was uh, difficult, but certainly we uh, have new rules for, for this specific program, the recovery plan program, uh, that uh, enables uh, uh, the structures to spend the money in an easier way than usual, although it could be easier. Um, for researchers, uh, uh, the, as I told you, the combined PhD program, the co-funded doctorates, for example, and the networking with these structured initiatives. I'm going to talk a little bit about these structured initiatives because actually at present are the most important investment we had. And it involves, as I said at the beginning, about 6 billion euros for the next three, four years. So it's very important. Uh, what was behind uh, the structural initiatives? These are, uh, as I said, 6 billion euros, no more than 60 initiatives, uh, so very big initiatives. And uh, the reason uh, for doing this was to uh, create the critical mass of scientists and technologists and research managers, uh, because uh, uh, what is lacking, uh, uh, in Italy at least, uh, is the system of research. So we have very good centers, uh, very uh, distributed uh, in different parts of Italy, but they don't link between each other. And they don't create the system. The system has never been created. So that was the purpose, and not to exclude anyone. So to take the, not to do something completely new, let's say, like you, you know, for example, uh, 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 human technopole, right, in Milan. Uh, that was uh, done from, from the top, uh, the, uh, put uh, somewhere, uh, completely new, without taking into account that there are researchers that, that were already there and they could have been working for that uh, purpose. So what I wanted to do was to um, give the opportunity of researchers that are already in the field uh, uh, to uh, uh, be finally financed for their job, but they have to do it uh, in a uh, co co correlative, in, 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 a, in a, a, let's say, um, a way that uh, creates uh, something that will last uh, also after uh, the recovery plan. So they have to create the network. Uh, 
And this could give our country uh, a better system uh, of donational research that is clear at the international level, that is inclusive, is organized, is easy to monitor, because it's very difficult to monitor. As you know, in Italy, we have uh, um, a typical evaluation that is done uh, ahead of the research, but then after it, uh, nobody tells you how the research did go, and, uh, and the monitoring is not existent, at least for the results of the research. It, it is for the administrative part, very important, but not for the uh, results of the research. And then impacting, to measure the impact on the economy system. To in, uh, provide uh, a better relationship with the public and private research, and to, uh, uh, in this way, uh, be able uh, to answer to the critical issues that are still there, that is the mobility, Certainly in Italy, people stopped at a certain way, time in their university or research center. They didn't move any longer. And, uh, and that the situation is a really a little bit uh, stuck there. Low salaries and difficult careers, this is one of the main issues. Uh, you know that very well. Uh, the stability of the funding, so you have maybe been found uh, one year and then you don't have anything more for a couple of years, so it's not stable, the system. And the investment on youngest, so uh, very, it's very difficult uh, uh, to have something dedicated uh, to those uh, who are, uh, let's say, younger than uh, 20, 35 years old. I don't say very young, but <laughs> neither 25. Uh, to show you how it works, I show you only uh, how do national centers work, but the other uh, initiatives uh, are a little bit the same. So for the national centers, uh, we had about 1.6 billion euro, and we decided uh, to launch a call uh, of uh, center on five uh, specific uh, key enabling technologies. So it is a link between research and uh, technologies. And uh, these centers, uh, the, the university, they, they really work together very well. Uh, not only the university, but also uh, uh, CNR, uh, INFN, and so on. Uh, and the private sector, uh, at least the big industries, not certainly the small, medium industry, decided uh, to be part uh, of, the, of, the, of these uh, calls. Uh, so at the end, we were able to assign, uh, you see, for example, uh, one center is on high performance computing, uh, big data and quantum computing. This is a center in Bologna uh, that is part of the Euro HPC and is run uh, by the INFN. But of course, it has, you see, 49 participants. Uh, the National Centers on Agricultural Technology is run by uh, Napoli Federico II, and it has 46 participants, and so on. Sustainable mobility, biodiversity, and the gene therapy and drugs-based RNA technologies. If you see the themes of these centers, uh, uh, these are really thought to last, okay? <laughs> it's not, uh, it is very important that we use uh, this four years money in order to, uh, to, to fill up the gap and then start from there, not to go back. That is the most important thing we have to do now. And we can do it if, we, if the people are also outside Italy, Italy understands what we are doing and uh, there is a mobility that becomes more bilateral between Italy and the, and the countries outside Italy. So it's the same thing for the innovation ecosystem, for the extended partnership, and, for, and we invested a lot also on research infrastructure, because these are the centers where people go and are attracted to do their research. If you see, there are centers like, for example, um, the, the um, you see here, uh, the aerosol clouds and trace gases research infrastructure, for example, that include uh, seven other research infrastructures uh, and uh, is a network of these uh, that has uh, um, really an incredible uh, um, funding, uh, very high. So they can really become something, uh, um, if the money is used properly, um, attracted for the Italian system. This is not enough, uh, and I conclude on this, uh, because uh, if you don't uh, do 
uh, use uh, in a proper way the funding from the European uh, that the, 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 the European funding. Um, you combine it with reforms uh, because without reforms is a waste of money. And uh, you do something uh, with your national funding as well. Uh, the system is, is not, cannot be created in the proper manner. So at the same time, uh, while we were doing that, uh, we and the financial law, so with the Italian funding, uh, decided, in, uh, first of all, uh, to increase uh, the ordinary funding of the universities. You see this increase goes from 250 million up to 860 million by 2026. This is very important because it's the money that the university, public universities have in order to, and, and then usually is spent uh, today is for electricity more than for research. So it's very important that we uh, help them uh, improving this system. Many of these increased uh, uh, funding uh, uh, has to be devoted uh, to recruitment. Uh, and you see how much it is. Uh, so other than the recruitment that you do every year in Italy for the turnover, okay, which is typical, you have people that are retiring and so you, you can hire the same amount of people, more or less depending on the quality of the university, qualitative indices, you have an extra budget to uh, recruit uh, new people. And um, you see that uh, this, this extra budget goes uh, to both professor, researcher, but also techni te uh, technologist and administrative staff. It's very important that we have uh, all uh, these people in the universities. Also, we uh, uh, improve uh, the salaries uh, of our technical staff because it's very low in Italy. And uh, pe these people now are requested everywhere, so it's very difficult to keep them in the universities. We co-finance uh, the direct calls, uh, which are very important, uh, and I increase those, uh, doubling those. Of course, there is still the problem of the <laughs> SSD, the uh, scientific sector. We, I, I increased the, the budget of the uh, Scuole Superiori, okay, the Col Superior, uh, like uh, PISA and so on. And uh, I increased the budget of the fellowships uh, of the PhD programs because here in England you, they pay, whereas in Italy they are paid for doing their PhD programs. Uh, also, uh, we establish, uh, as I said before, uh, it's very important that we have a system uh, uh, that is constant. Uh, and so uh, we uh, started two new programs. Uh, one is Fondo Italiano per la Scienza, FIS, uh, which is similar to the ERC program. And uh, this is, starts with a low budget, 50 million, but then it goes up to 250 million by 2025. And this is again something that researchers, they know that there will be that budget every year and that they can apply. And it's very similar to the ERC. But also we did the same ERC program, but for the applied sciences. So it's more an EIT, EIC program. Uh, the, whereby we would like to finance those uh, researchers that have something that is already, um, let's say, um, innovative uh, and uh, at risk, okay? The innovation at risk, that is uh, the, 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 the funding why, uh, for, for what is uh, thought about. And again, it decreases at 250. For doing all this, what we need today, and it's very important, and I conclude on this, is that we have a good, uh, I know it's very technical, but it's one of the reasons why people go abroad, uh, to have a system of the evaluation of research and the researches that is properly done. Properly done means that it, it is, it has, uh, right experts, uh, that it includes uh, uh, referees from all over the world, uh, not so only on specific, uh, let's say, national uh, databases, but the database has to be really global. And uh, that is stable, again, uh, that, that it, it, it uses uh, um, parameters uh, that at least for that call are always the same. They don't change from time to time depending on the people who are uh, uh, included. So we uh, constructed a new CNWR means uh, a National Center uh, uh, for the Evaluation of Research uh, that is done by 15 uh, experts. 
Uh, Pier Piero Baglioni was the president of this center until a few months ago. And uh, they work on different databases of, research, of referees, uh, taking care of gender equality, um, of uh, increasing the number of the evaluation committees, and finally, we also pay for <laughs> the people who do the, 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 the evaluation because this is the problem. I tell you uh, that, of, nevertheless, the the. The, 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 this change, uh, we still have problem with the evaluation. Many referees, but this is uh, the same, uh, I guess, in all over Europe, uh, uh, they uh, reject uh, the, uh, the, the evaluation, even though they are paid for this. Almost, uh, let's say, that we are able to retain 10% of our uh, referees, no more than that. So it, this is a big problem. Um, and uh, I guess it's uh, similar also when you go to the evaluation of scientific journals, of scientific papers, uh, it's very similar. And it's something that uh, is not only Italian, it's European, and actually it's worldwide, because uh, uh, we had a meeting in Japan of all ministers, and it was the same all over the world. So uh, if we are not able uh, to um, really keep our system uh, as a typical peer review uh, system, uh, then uh, all of us are going to lose something, and it's very important that we work on this. Um, and with that, uh, I think that um, I take uh, enough time of you, and uh, but I hope that I give you at least uh, the idea on how Italy is moving uh, in terms of research. This is uh, uh, has been confirmed by the, uh, the pre present ministry, who is uh, keep on working uh, with these lines, and uh, uh, is uh, uh, something that needs time uh, because reforms, in particular, are difficult then to take really um, and to, to have the effect that they should have. Uh, but uh, at least we started. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the uh, overview of the uh, action during the PNRR. It should have been a, a sort of a round table, but there's a, a, a very small table a now, a single person table. Uh, so maybe you, you can still uh, have a seat. And uh, so what I'm going to, as you know, um, yeah, unfortunately, Today, a very strange phenomenon happened happening in the UK. The no amount of uh, high, high performance computing can predict. There is about one and a half centimeters of snow, which means every airport is closed, all the trains are shut down. So, this is the heroes who made it uh, after uh, a lot of uh, uh, effort in order to come to this event today. Otherwise, we would have had the, the full room. So, uh, we apologize for the British weather, which seems to be like a. a, a very strange statement to make, and they still don't know how to deal with this. Um, so, are there any questions uh, for Professor? Okay, let's start from here. Yeah. Um, thanks. It was very, very interesting coming from England to see how much has been done in Italy recently. I, I have a question because I am in one of the panel as a reviewer. And uh, recently, uh, we, had, uh, um, we had a sort of induction, what we have to do. And I know that some people step down because it looks very, very complicated. And every time we asked the lady that was uh, telling us what we have to do, um, she said, it's the ministry that decides this. So I cannot do anything. These are the rules, like, for example, giving one grant per person, and uh, that person has to be expert on everything or so on. So I was wondering, who is the ministry? <laughs> because it, it becomes, I mean, a scientist like you probably knows that if I am expert on something, another person is expert better than me in something else. And it's, it's good to confront opinion. So I have the responsibility to decide one grant, just one person, and with little discussion with the other. So I was just wondering, who is the ministry yeah. that decides this? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, of course, uh, it's not the ministry that decides. Let's say that uh, um, what happened is that uh, for many of these grants, 
uh, we have, as you know, uh, to spend the money in a certain, in a very limited time, which is not fit for research. Research doesn't, I mean, it's very difficult to do all of these uh, in, uh, we, 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 we have to, um, uh, to be able by 2026 uh, to, um, to have all the spent uh, showed uh, to Europe, uh, to the European Commission. So uh, uh, what probably happened uh, is that we really have a lot of projects now and we need a lot of referees, there are not enough. And the people, uh, not the ministry, let's say the funzionari, so it, uh, <laughs> the people who have the admin, they are administrative, they don't know anything about research. They, they just have a, a certain uh, duty to do and they want to have that done, that's it. There is no, there is no much uh, <laughs> other to say. So uh, I, as I say, that this is just the beginning. Uh, what we did uh, is that uh, we, uh, by law, design a new structure that should be like uh, the agency. You remember that we talked about this in Italy a long time ago. And uh, the structure is the structure for the evaluation that should be a little bit separated by the minister and uh, should work uh, as the agencies uh, all around the world. So that is already um, done. The law is there. Uh, the money is there because it was the money that was supposed to go to the, to the agency. Uh, it just has to be done. <laughs> okay, next question. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I think it's very important uh, the communication because even in the academic field is not so clear. But it's important the communication also uh, to make clear to the scientific community that this is not only an opportunity of funding as an, another, but is the unique opportunity for the growth of our country. Uh, I am in a, an evaluation committee for the Ministry of Health, uh, not for the Ministry of... Uh, and first I, I realized the problem which was raised, referees are not well aware, and also applicants do not understand very clearly that this is something important for the country. So I think that some money should be spent also for communication in order to inform people uh, uh, of this opportunity. Yeah. But uh, before a brief question, uh, I would like to thank you also for the great work that you have done as ministry. The academic field is very, uh, is aware of your competence and vision, and we sincerely do hope uh, that the new ministry will continue in the line. Thank you. My question refers to uh, chiamate dirette. Uh, I see that there, there is some uh, uh, funding for this, but these, uh, as you know, are based on tabelle di equivalenza, which are not gratifying for those who move from one country and want to go back. Uh, the second thing they ask is the possibility of uh, uh, separate the possibility of funding in order to continue their, their research. So I think that uh, the, uh, the Kuhn should review the tables uh, this, uh, uh, because uh, these are old and for some countries are not valid. And uh, also uh, I think that uh, uh, there should be the possibility for uh, people, uh, young researchers working abroad, uh, to apply for grants uh, because th they are limited now to the Italian environment. Of course, the money should be spent in Italy, but application uh, from young people perhaps uh, should come also from other countries. Um, I have seen that there are more scholarship because the Levi Montalcini scholarship are really very few every year. So that was very good. Uh, well, okay, thank you. Before you reply, uh, as Roberto says, we have like a small amount of people. So can you introduce yourself? Maria Grazia Spillantini. I am professor at the University of Cambridge. 
and I work on molecular neurology. Ah, bello. My name is Sergio Bonino, I'm professor of medicine. Uh, I, I work here at the European Medicine Agency and now I am at uh, the Institute of the National Research Council. Okay, please, uh, we can... Well, no, nothing, I, I totally agree, uh, both on the communication side and also on the way uh, to improve uh, uh, the way we can uh, uh, I mean, uh, recruit people from abroad uh, directly without undergoing uh, all the process <laughs> that we have in Italy, which is quite complicated. Uh, the problem is that certainly uh, uh, the classification of our system uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, deny uh, the, 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 the call of people that are absolutely outstanding, uh, but because they don't fit perfectly on that specific field, uh, they are rejected by their colleagues, because that is a, <laughs> is, is a thing amongst colleagues, actually. And uh, this is the most difficult system to change because it's, it's so radicated uh, and it goes from, uh, let's say, father to child, uh, that is very difficult to uh, eradicate it. But th it has to happen. There is no way we can grow without uh, changing the system. What I think is that other than uh, uh, um, include the youngest, uh, uh, for example, in, in one of the, uh, the call we did, uh, uh, the 600 uh, million for young uh, researchers, we uh, include uh, mainly uh, those uh, young people uh, uh, who are in the seal of excellence uh, uh, of uh, Marie Curie grants. And they, they answer, so they, 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 luckily many of those uh, people are coming back, at least try to come back to Italy for a while because they get the position as a researcher, uh, although it's a, uh, as a, um, a, a five years time researcher. Um, but also I think that we should change uh, the salaries, actually. And uh, they should go more, uh, they should take care of the salaries uh, within the same, uh, let's say professor, associate or full professor, you should have a range of, uh, uh, and that maybe the new minister is going to put this as a new law in the financial law. I hope she's going to do it. So that you can pay more who works more, who has better results, because otherwise it's uh, very difficult to recruit people from abroad. Okay, thank you. There was another question. Start with your self-introduction. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, your presentation was really inspiring. And um, my question is also about the Chiamate Dirette. Um, I'm actually one of the people who were called back this year, and oh. I will boom, move to the University of Modena from Bravo. January. <laughs> um, oh, my name is Bene Bassetti, by the way, Associate Professor, University of Birmingham currently. My question is, um, so you're calling back lots of us. What do you think we should do once we're back in Italy? What do you expect from us? Ah. <laughs> well, it's nothing different than what I expect from every researcher, actually. Uh, the, to do properly and uh, possibly in a positive way your job, and also to let's try to day by day, you know, change a little bit the, med the mentality of many uh, other colleagues. Uh, particularly, I accept those of our uh, oldest generation, but not the young generation, please. <laughs> they have to change. Okay, next question. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Alessandro Coatti and I'm a senior science policy officer at the Royal Society of Biology, which is um, a learned society. Um, I have a question between the link uh, about the link between your evaluation um, exercise or, or framework and the funding that goes to universities, the FFO, as, as you wrote it. Um, because it seemed to have pulled together teaching, research, environment, uh, and that money should boost um, recruitment of, of people. Um, I'm trying to kind of match it to the way the UK works, which I kind of know better. Um, so here you have a research excellence framework um, assessment and then you have a teaching excellence assessment and this is run by 
different organizations that are arm length from the government, as you suggested, this body will be. Um, and that has been kind of going on for 20 years or even more. Uh, but every iteration, every seven years, there is a big review of how you, you assess excellence in research and then how you set up the reviewing panels, how you create the guidance, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been involved with the last one. Um, so I'm wondering whether, whether this is what you envision. You will have a big nationwide research excellence assessment that then directs the funding to the university according to certain criteria that, that you devise. Um, I have another question, but maybe I'll stop here for now. And uh... Yes, we do uh, have a system that has been changed um, uh, with the uh, Gelmini law, the 240. So since uh, 2012, uh, so now the, the funding goes uh, part with the historical part because uh, you cannot close universities. I mean, that is very difficult. Uh, but at least 30% goes uh, depending on the results uh, of the VQR. VQR is the uh, quantitative evaluation of research that is done every five years, every three, four, four years uh, from the ANVUR, uh, the agency of the evaluation. The problem uh, uh, is that, uh, and then, and then uh, the rest uh, is uh, distributed according to the standard costs uh, of the students. So you calculate uh, depending on the region and where you are, uh, what is the standard cost. Also, scientific versus humanistic science this is a little bit different. Uh, the point is that uh, there are two problems. The first one is that uh, you do many corrections, so there is a linear curve uh, uh, that goes, uh, the, 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 the major uh, actually um, um, index uh, that decide uh, of the funding uh, is the number of students at the end of the day. So the biggest university, the biggest money you get. So, and, and it's a linear curve with the very small R, very high R. Um, the second problem is that the system by which we evaluate uh, the research production is old and is still stick and related uh, to the sectors. And that's, uh, is, so it's really what we, is the classification of knowledge that has to change. Because if you don't ch change that, then you will create always the same system. So that is the problem. So I think in the UK, they try to, to implement also an impact assessment. So how much the research outputs actually lead to other forms of impact. And then I think more and more try to capture the, um, the quality of the environment of the university. So not just how the research, yeah, like career, career quality in a way and other. But that areas. is changing now, right? Yeah, I mean, right now. We have yeah, to not, find new indexes. The H index probably is not the best index we have. <laughs> Neither are the impact factor of the journal. So really we have to find new indexes, but that is all over. Uh, even though in the UK, the research evaluation framework, I think is not good at all. And there were, uh, uh, there was a paper published that they showed that just by taking the H index of the researchers, they found in about half an hour the same result that an entire research evaluation framework found in like a one year or two years of work. So I think the UK has nothing to teach to anybody when it comes to evaluation. <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> yes, Paolo Radelli from the University of Oxford. I wanted to make a very similar point. So there are two features that are important about the British system. Almost everybody hates it. All right, that's Everybody one. hates it. Right. Okay, particularly the, in right. the non-scientific areas. Uh, so you know, humanists and uh, perhaps social scientists a little bit more. The, the, I think the scientist tolerates it a little bit more. But at the same time, everybody recognizes that is necessary. Yeah. And it's 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 a cultural thing, right? So it's a price that we pay for independence. So we can appoint uh, assist, assistant or associate professors by panels of colleagues because everybody knows that the quality related component of the research depends on how good the colleagues that you're bringing into the department is. Now, what I've noticed about the Italian debate that this is not at all accepted. So it's mostly a cultural issue that I can see from here. You know, there's a lot of forums in which people state that they don't want to be judged. It's almost as though this was 
the demeaning there. It's it's lowering their dignity. Can you comment on this? I think I think this is a very important aspect that needs to be overcome in it. Well, I think that uh, the big difference uh, is that uh, uh, the system uh, in England and uh, in UK and uh, in the US is driven by the market. In Italy, is driven by the institutions. So is a is a different. Uh, uh, the aim you have uh, as an administrator uh, is that of uh, working with public money for the institution that has to last, not for the market that is around your university and your system. It's a different way. I don't know which is the best, though, after all these years. Maybe one, one, when I was old, younger, I would have told you the market system is much better because it's clear. I mean, you have, you have to succeed and it's there. But nowadays, I'm not sure about that, particularly you looking at UK. <laughs> okay, so we have only a few minutes left. So maybe I, I go back to the original topic of the conversation, which is the National Plan of Recovery and Resilience. And yes, six billion, they seem a large amount of money. They appear to be over four years, but we know that it's in fact two years and a half because most of the devaluation just finished and I don't know, I don't even know how much of the money has been. I know there's been some ceremonies in uh, in Bologna for the High Performance Center, but they so they probably spend the money for the tea and coffee and pastas. But to the vast majority of the 320 million has not been spent. Then we look at the number of people that people are not people, but they are their groups or even in some cases institutions. So we, we find out that over this period of three years per research institution or per research group, they essentially get a million each or something like that because 320 divided 50 divided four or divided three. So it's not a, a very large amount of money. And the same happens for most of the actions because clearly the uh, expenditure has been diverted towards OPEX, towards personnel. And for example, new buildings are impossible because of a variety of reasons, including the fact that the cost of build has increased over 20% with respect to when the uh, Bandi were published. And this would have increased by 20% of the costs going outside all the limits. So it's a very good initiative, but uh, we now, uh, Italy now faces the problem of hiring a ginormous amount of PhD student researchers even these managers of, for research, research managers, 100,000 euros salary for three years. But then what happens? There is a lack of at least 10 or 20% of the total forever should have been added just to pay for the OPEX uh, for the rest of the lifetime of these initiatives. Uh, on the top of the fact that I find it very difficult people even to hire the PhD students going and finding another 10 times. We cannot find PhD students here. I don't know you guys, but I mean, we have a hard time finding it. So where, do, where would Italy find the additional tens of thousands of PhD students and researchers fixed term? And then in uh, June 2026, okay, it's December 2025 plus six months, what happens to all these thousands of people that may have been found probably at the last minute? Of course, it's um, challenging. Um, let's say a few things. First of all, uh, that uh, we cannot succeed uh, if uh, we don't find position of all these researchers that are not only university position. I mean, there is no way. Only 10% of these people could be retained in the future. These are people that should go and do uh, innovative uh, working for industries, uh, for uh, public administration, for cultural uh, um, issues uh, and, and uh, organizations. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, certainly, it will be a big problem. I think that uh, the academic uh, career uh, is still something that uh, uh, is very selective. There is no way. I mean, I mean not, it's not for uh, everybody and it cannot include anybody. But at the same time, uh, um, uh, it's true that uh, the number of researchers in Italy, whatever, public, private, in Italy, are much less than in all other countries. So if we are able to create a generation, a generation of researchers that is a little bit larger than the one we are coming from, uh, Italy can compete better on different issues. Of course, 
It has to be able then to keep these people in Italy or to have them a, a circulation of brains and not only a withdrawal of brains. And that is an, is an important issue. But that has more to do on, uh, um, on the way uh, it is, you are evaluated, on the way uh, you can do your careers, uh, on the way they, uh, you can do your uh, research and the independency that you have uh, then on funding is a mental is a, is a, is a problem more uh, is a more a cultural problem than not uh, a financial problem so i think that this is a big uh, opportunity uh, uh, the system answered to the cause in a very responsible and fast manner there are uh, leading universities uh, that have much more the uh, <laughs> funding than what you said because if you combine all the different calls, uh, then uh, there are uh, centers like uh, CNR or INFN that, have, uh, that are really crossing uh, all the different calls that we are having. So it's really uh, an incredible amount of funding. Uh, and, uh, and you're right, uh, I mean, uh, if you have then to buy something, uh, very simply, and you have the usual rules, uh, it, it can be very challenging. But there are uh, different rules for PNRR uh, in Italy today. So they could, I hope they will be able to do it. So yes, most of this money uh, tends to be spent in new equipment and people are now rushing to buy it and then in a lot of uh, uh, fixed um, positions. But uh, again, the question is what happens to these labs that are full of equipment and full of fixed term jobs that have no perspective for the long term. But you say they move to industry, but then the amount of equipment that is bought is for a lab with all those people, and then 90% of those will have to go away. So we run the risk at the end of this injection of cash to find very well stocked uh, laboratories throughout all Italy, the bigger university with more, the smaller university with less, but then no people to, to run it. And especially, just think about something, I mean, a transmission electron microscope requires one or 200,000 euros per year of service cost just to keep it going. So there are many people now buying one, two, three, or four of them. And then how do you find the extra million per year that you just need to run the equipment that you have bought via the PNRR? So how are these uh, centers that are distributed, mostly virtual, almost none of them is a new building, a new center really like the IAT or the Human Technopole or many others were. So how do they continue after the PNR? Uh, they, uh, they did the plan uh, by when, because it was required, a long time uh, plan. Um, and um, as for people, uh, don't forget that uh, we, uh, tripled uh, the recruitment of the universities for the next four years. So and that was done really thinking about uh, on how many researchers, you say that you do almost 1,000 researchers each year during PNRR, so you have 4,000 people more after, after these four years. But also with the increasing of the ordinary fund, you have the possibility to hire all those people. If you take uh, people from uh, uh, outside uh, and not just promotion inside the universities, of course. That is, a, again, a responsibility of the university. As for the running cost, uh, uh, well, those are uh, business plans that have been made together between public and private. The private uh, companies that are uh, in these centers uh, at the moment, they pay for being there. They are not getting money. And uh, the, these centers uh, are supposed uh, to produce uh, spin off startup, uh, and maybe under, uh, uh, let's say, creating also jobs uh, so that uh, they can survive uh, themselves. Okay, so the time is up. I'm sure we can continue for another three or four hours, but we can't. So thank we you. thank uh, Professor Metz again. Thank you very much. And I pass to Roberto for the second part. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Messa. Uh, Professor Baglioni was supposed to be here, but unfortunately his uh, airplane was cancelled this morning at 6 a.m. He sent me a message and he couldn't. I mean, he was postponed till this evening, so it was too late for him to come. So um, I think we can move 
to the second part of our day. So after this panel discussion, now we're going to have three speakers. We will start with Simonetta Agnello Pombi, and then Pietro Leo, and, and finally Gian Paolo Balsam. And after these three uh, speeches, we will have a, a break and continue with the awards. So um, I want to invite uh, Simonetta Agnello Hornby to, um, to give the speech. Maybe you can, you can use the table here. Um, she's an Italian novelist who worked as a solicitor for a legal aid firm uh, specialized in domestic violence and as a part-time judge at the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal. This is two of the things that impressed me in your CV. It's a pleasure to have you here. She will talk about uh, la contintezza. is always there, but one just needs to find it. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very humbled and confused uh, being with people who know so much, who have worked so much in this field. And, um, but I will speak about what you want me to do. Um, I'm British now, but uh, I came to England from Sicily when I was 18 because my mother thought I had to learn three languages by the time I was 20. And I had forgotten on purpose German for reasons which can be imagined. So there was this problem of this daughter who didn't speak three languages and she was 18. So I was sent here to learn English in Cambridge. And um, lo and behold, fell in love with an Englishman, which wasn't planned or even envisaged in my family. And uh, I stuck to that. Papa said, you will not marry until you're 21. So I married at 21 in one month. And um, I think my husband was a very good and tolerant and patient son-in-law for Papa and uh, adored my mother. Uh, I always believed in justice. I don't know why. Coming from Sicily, justice is something a bit peculiar, to be honest. Lots of things very unjust were considered just. Um, there were the days when the Mafia was in power in the region, in the local government. Um, my father was against it, so he didn't do that well but many of my relatives uh, had to cave in. So it was a very strange world in which a lot of injustices took place for what other people thought was justice for them. I lived in the States and then in Africa where I learned uh, how to be an English solicitor. Very bizarre. Zambia had been uh, a new country for two years. My husband was sent there by the United Nations and I had nothing to do, so I thought I had to work. And I said I had a law degree in Italy. I'd done also law at the University of Kansas. So I thought, let's see what's going on in Zambia and nothing was going on. So I went up to Cairo right, looking for a job in the three legal firms of the whole of the capital. And in the second legal firm, they said, um, would you like to do debt collection? And I didn't really know what that was. I said, yes. And uh, I became the debt collector at Wasserberger and Company, the second largest firm in Zambia, which had 20 people. And I took over the job of head of the debt collector department from a lady who had no degree, but everything was, it was a pre-computer, computerized system, A, B, C, D, letter C, two, three, put that connection, and then a number of Zambian clerks would do it. What did I learn there? I learned the concept of justice, which changes from country to country. And one has to respect it, even if I don't like it, because that's their concept of justice, and that's their justice. Uh, I also learned uh, that Zambia was not that different from Sicily, which confused me completely, because I never thought of a comparison. Um, I was collecting debts for Harrods and uh, one of the debitrice, one of the person I had to get money from was the Princess Nakatindi, which was of a lousy breed, which was one of the three nations of Zambia. And she hadn't paid what um, 
was bought at Harold's in her name. My clerks were trembling when I told them to send the letter. And they trembled even more when they said that the princess was very angry. And they trembled even to the degree that they just couldn't think when they said she's coming one of those days. And there was I, you know, that collector at Wasserberger and Company, and walks this woman who looked exactly like one of the many Palermo ladies, except for the color of her skin. Short, big bosom, high heels, jewels, compact, walked in and said, what's that? And that was the letter asking her to pay. Um, I got up because I thought that should be done. My clacks were not there, I was alone in my room. And that she liked, but I was taller than her because she was small. And I said, would you like to sit down? And she sat. And then I said, Princess, this is a debt with Harold. What can I say? Well, she said, it's the fault of my third husband. Oh, I said, Princess, sorry. No, she said, I'm a princess. And we have polyandria and polygamia at the royal court. So she had three husbands, all alive, all with children from her, except the last one because she took him with her, because he was so good looking that she was afraid people would take him away from her or abuse him when she was traveling to England, because she was in the foreign office. And, uh, and she said, I can't take him with me all the time. And also my children, two of them are you know, at public schools in England. They don't like my third husband. So I think it's better if I go on my own. And uh, so I give him my card and say, don't spend too much. And he spends too much. And I said, princess, you got to pay. But I'm a princess. I said, I know that. I come from humble barons, but my aunt married a prince, and I've got another cousin who's a prince. And if they're dead, they've got to pay. Really? She said, absolutely. Everybody has got to pay. It doesn't matter. And she paid. That made me understand lots of things about the world. How one can never be surprised, because I was shocked by this woman. How sometimes it's useful to speak about yourself when you're a professional, which I think is abhorrent and I shouldn't have done. But I wouldn't have got there. I wouldn't have got that payment if I didn't tell her a little bit about me. And also, how when one works, they say there must always be a bit of humor. That's, I think, the best thing I've learned from the British, humor. We have no sense of humor in Sicily. Here may be perhaps too much, uh, or sometimes too much in my view, but it is, a way of looking at the world and making it lighter and getting on with life. But it mustn't be ever exceeded. Again, going personal, I came to England, I became a solicitor. I had a firm which was good. My staff were fantastic. We were the first, and I think only still, department, legal firm, which had a department dedicated to domestic violence. And uh, we put an ad in the papers for the person who should run it. I, the partner, was a female, and we were something like 70% women and 30% men in the firm. Mm -hmm. And the best person was a man, and I took him. And the feminist hated me and gave me utter unhappiness because they were heavy and nasty, and they took everything that they could take to pieces from my background. And coming from Sicily, as you understand, that the word mafia is repeated endlessly. Um, but we stuck to it. We said, no, we think it's the best and it happens to be male. And we caved in only on one thing. I said, we will tell the client that if she wants a solicitor immediately, we have got him here waiting for her. If she wants a female solicitor, we may not have it ready, but we may get a solicitor within a day or two. And there was no question, no battered woman would say anything but now. Nah. Then all the firm learned uh, complex system of domestic violence. So the department disappeared, that the whole firm became that, which meant that most of our clients were so miserable that there was no laugh at Hornby and Libya unless we really pushed them. Um, although we won all the cases because we were good and our clients had good reasons to go to court. And there were also men who were victim of violence of women. There's not only women who are victim of violence. And that violence is not known because men don't disclose it. So it's a big problem. Anyway, going back to that, I was asked to speak of contentizza. There was nothing of contentizza in my working life, as you can understand. And yet, we had it. I didn't think I could push my staff as I did if they didn't have minutes 
even 10 minutes a day of contentezza, of being able to laugh, of eating something good. It is not true that people must be so immersed in their work that uh, any distraction really isn't good. Yes, as you are in court or if you're a doctor and is cutting somebody's body, must be concentrating then. But then I think there's always the time and almost the duty for that person or others to relax. And to relax uh, with a pleasure which is easy and always at your disposition. Um, we had uh, a variety of cakes and sweets in the office, which might not have been good for those who were on a diet. But I could see after one of my lawyers had a bad meeting with the client that he went down to the kitchen and he pinched that cake and had his cup of coffee and came back ready to start all over again. And he could see in his face that there was a bit of contentizza, which is a Sicilian word, which I don't know how to say in English nor in in Italian, I don't think it exists. Contentizza is not contentment. Contentizza is not happiness. Contentizza with that little UN in it, which is usually a negative thing, is uh, the ending in you is of something small. Um, contentizza is something that you can find everywhere. You just have to look for it. And we in Sicily, who are, I believe, uh, the only nation in Europe which has been dominated by everybody, and I said no independence ever. We were there were days of the Kingdom of Sicily, but the, but the Spaniards were running it, and we need Contentita more than anybody else because it's very much in us this feeling worse than the others and this duty, if you like to appease and do whatever we can for people from the continent, uh, as against treating them as somebody like us. And it continues to be in all the possible aspects. Um, I've kept my Sicilian accent because I couldn't speak Italian with anybody else, actually, in my world, there were no Italians. But also because Papa said, when I got married, it wasn't pleased, he said, I hope that even if you live abroad, when you speak, you will speak with a Sicilian accent, even English. And I don't know about the English, but my English should be better than it is. It's okay, I win the cases. But certainly I don't have the good English that other people do, having lived 52 years abroad. And I think it's just in memory of my father. This book was written during the lockdown. I thought that was the right time and the right moment. Um, I believe that all of us in Europe, and I'm putting myself into Europe, all of us in Europe have had such a wealth of well-being. We have been so rich and so powerful in the last 1,000 years. It is quite amazing when one looks at the other nations and what Europe has done, not always together, it has been a development from the north to the south, extraordinary. Um, it has been a development that we have shared without even realizing it with many other people. Um, there's no European who has only European blood. We have had so many people who have come and we have mixed. It's quite extraordinary, this... Um, unity that I see with Europeans and without them realizing it and without me realizing it I learned that because I lived in other continents and then I could see the difference when I look at um, the progress that China has done and it is extraordinary I think the one progress they didn't do is to try to mix a bit with different people maybe it was impossible for them because of the background and that will be their fault because we Europeans, whether we liked it or not, it might have started with the Ratto della Sabine, which was a long time ago. There was always this desire at the end to mix your blood with somebody else and so to improve. Contentizza was therefore a book to keep me happy and to make me see the good in my life at my flat, which is 15 minutes from here. I was at home all the time, except for one walk once a week, I was going to see my son, I've got a son who is ill, 
So I used to go under his house. I used to walk all the way to Dulwich and then call him. And then, you know, the wheelchair came to the bedroom, to the front door. You know, the children might have been upstairs. And uh, I was in the street and we said, hello, bye bye. And the other son came and brought me my shopping. And that was it. So if I didn't do something for the contentists, I don't know what I would have done. I suppose I would have painted the house, I would have broken everything, I would have done things. But uh, it was good to think of it. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it also was a book for the future. It's written with Costanza Gravina, who is the daughter of my cousin Silvano, who is like a brother. And she's like a daughter because I have no daughters. And Costanza is redheaded. Uh, she has Norman blood, but we in Sicily have got a lot of red hair for other reasons as well. Better not to think about it. I like red hair. And uh, she's a pharmacist, so you know, nothing to do with the law. And we decided that we were going to write about our contentitza. And she wrote, and she never re written before. I did. And I bought, I've learned so much about her, about the world of the young. I also learned how little they know of the real past of uh, the practical things, in spite of the fact that my cousin, who is a farmer, but he cooks fantastically well, because like, like me and my sister, we're given the little books of uh, the cuisine of Mademoiselle and another cook that were the family of our mothers. And, um, and with her, so we exchanged the views on the telephone. We criticized what we had written. We asked explanation of the other. And, um, and we enjoy ourselves tremendously. I never thought that one would have such nice conversation with uh, a girl who is 55 years younger than me, which is a lot, and you know, just, you know, you, we have different worlds. Um, we rate it, we thought that it should go to Mondadori, I think it is Mondadori, yes it is. And uh, they took it, and, um, and it has gone well. And she has learned how to present books, which she didn't. Uh, and uh, I found it a great pleasure. I think I read sometimes um, little things about history, about my past. Um, but on the whole, it was really a question of feelings and what I learned from others in my life abroad. Um, we lack a contentitza in the world. Uh, and if I may say so, the two professions which are if we include that of prostitution, the oldest professions in the world is the law, which is justice, and the doctor. And uh, both professions, certainly in England, but also I think in Italy, do not consider contentitza something important for them. I've now learned, when I don't practice anymore, that if I'd had a bit of contentitza, if I'd had this little book with me, when I saw some clients that I couldn't stand, I would have been kinder. I would have done what I had to do because that was my job, but I wouldn't have been as rough and say, well, Mr. So-and-so, if you don't accept that you're breaking the legs of your wife because I've got her to fall down, I don't think I can represent you. No, I would have thought that Contentista would have molded me and would have maybe got on with that man and possibly kick him out when he did it next thing, but possibly he might not have done it. Um, contentista is necessary to live with others. Um, I have had one GP in England who is dead, who I couldn't speak to him then, he was dead, he died when my children were little. He had contentitza in his manners. He had contentitza in the way he spoke to these patients. He had a little sharp eye when he saw the children doing something naughty and then telling them, sit down, I still have got to take a look at your foot, what's going on there. Uh, I think doctors should have continued, so perhaps they have it and they haven't noticed it, because usually you don't expect it from other professions, and I certainly didn't until I read continued. Uh, it makes life better for everybody to have a smile and a bit of humour and, and a bit of empathy, but not too much, because the professional difference must be always kept. And in today's world, often isn't, and that is not right. We may call each other by name, but I think it is very important with the professionals, and I, and I really mean only the lawyer and the doctor, there must be some difference. Um, 
I say that because I'm afraid I had in my life quite a number of cases in which some doctors went beyond what they should have done with some patients. And the patients were right. I heard they were wrong, but they didn't. And the same I've heard about lawyers. So it's um, a world in which we really have to think on Tintitsa. We've got appreciate it, put it in action, but always watch carefully about our professional duties, which is a difficulties in today's world. I don't like in today's world how we are all much of a muchness, how we all think that we have got to be like the other person next to me, rather than look at ourselves with our profession or what we have to do or our desires. There is this um, desire to be part of, a, of any group um, and um, because that is the, the hope that we will get some contented and some happiness or some acknowledgement or some success. While I think one has got to think always of himself uh, and um, if he or she, if we want to enjoy ourselves, we can within the limits. With a bit of humour, which is English, in Sicily, there is humour, but it's more sarcasm, but that's the history. And uh, enjoy life and trying to be helpful to others, but never forgetting what we are. We are a profession. We speak for somebody. We do things for somebody. We are not that person. I think I finished here. Yeah, if you want to ask me questions about anything else, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. So, are there any questions for Simonetta? Yes, okay, I'll start over there and then I come to you. <clears throat> Maybe just a quick one. Um, in the many years you lived abroad, have you ever missed uh, Sicily? Um, was Sicily always close to your heart? Uh, and what is it that you missed the most if you did? I hate to tell you that I've never missed Sicily because Sicily is in my house. If one walks in there's a painting of Monte Pellegrino, you get somewhere else there's something of my aunt, somewhere else something that mama gave me. And um, I go to Sicily regularly. I, lots of people are missing things. I miss that, I miss that. I wonder how much pleasure it gives to somebody to say I miss something and they think perhaps somebody will have some empathy for them. I made a choice to marry a foreigner. So that was it. I, you know, I knew I was going to live abroad. Um, I've never spoken in English in my house. My children speak Italian, my husband learned it. So I was a bit in Italy, in Sicily. I had constant relatives. Um, I wish I had missed Sicily, uh, because people think I'm peculiar that I don't, but it is there. Uh, and I knew. And I don't understand people who make decisions and then miss. Uh, I knew that I wouldn't be there when my father would die and my mother would die. It was so sad, awful, but I knew. Um, I'm, no, I didn't. I would miss my house if I didn't have all those things around me there. So I think if you surround yourself the little things uh, that remind you of people, of situations, of taste, uh, um, then you carry it with you. That's, sorry about that. Thanks. It's very, very nice the way you explain that. I, I know that you like cooking recipe. So what is your recipe for uh, la contintizza? The recipe for la contintizza? Well, what can give contintizza of the physical things is uh, the smells. And uh, I like all the smells of the kitchen. Uh, la vaniglia. Cannella, my favorite is cannella, which is, what is it called in English? It's an ugly word, isn't it? I always say cannella. And, um, and cannella reminds me of Sicily, very strong. So my kitchen is full of all the things that I bring from Palermo when I come. 
Um, cooking is very important. Culturally, cooking is very important. Um, I pity those who don't cook because they miss tremendous pleasures. Um, first of all, cooking is what made us different from the other animals. So at least we ought to have some cooking that, uh, that made us human beings. Uh, cooking is creation constantly because my meals never come good enough. Um, because I forget things, so I walk somewhere else, so there's a telephone call and it's too cooked. And then I salvage it if I can. Uh, I think eating with people is fundamental. That's what I didn't have during the coronavirus. And, and cooking is transformation. Cooking is a tremendous joy. I mean, it's really contented at its most in the kitchen. Um, we are cooks in our family, men and women. Um, my mother and my aunt uh, wrote a book of the recipes of their mother for us, uh, for my cousin Silvano, and for me, and my sister didn't marry, and, um, and we copied them. And it is not just a, a recipe book, it's life. Each recipe has the name of the person who gave it to us, and we know who they are, because Mama and Sia Teresa would tell us. Uh, there were lots of prefects in Agrigento, who seemed to have had a tremendous amount of daughters who were spinsters, who taught the Giudice sisters all the cook all the cakes of northern Italy because the prefects were always from the north, obviously. And so we have uh, Le Ciccarini's uh, pastine and all the cakes that they gave. And then we had uh, all the cakes that were given to my mother's family by the cooks who left and they were well treated, so they gave their recipes. So we got all the recipes of those cooks, or the cooks of relatives, you know, La Tia Graziella's uh, pastina. It's just like, you say, oh, how can I not miss this? This is this there. So I have a question. I mean, you have been here for many years. I've been here for 30 years. I grew up, uh, kids here were born British and so on, and uh, Brexit referendum shocked us. And the country, this country, it's not yet clear which way is is going. And my question for you is, how do you see the next five years? Well, I mean, where do you think this country will will go? Because it has been drifting for a, for a while now. Um, I don't believe that um, today's Britain will be the same twenty in twenty years time. I think there is an utter, almost suicidal risk that uh, the United Kingdom will not exist uh, in the future. They made uh, both Tories and Labour stupid mistakes. Uh. Um, you may not remember because you were not here, but about uh, 50 years ago there was a move to make uh, the children of the royal family part of the children of Britain. So Charles and Anne were sent to Luna Parks to go to places, and it was pathetic. Anne would cope with it, Charles couldn't. And it, it was ridiculous. It was uh, approaching, you know, getting their children to approach the country. Look what happened. Uh, I think that um, sooner or later Scotland will want to separate, and I think it will be a mistake for Scotland. But the Scots, whom I like very much, are terribly stubborn, and they never see the future. So they'll do that. Then. Uh, Northern Ireland must sooner or later become part of Europe and the and Southern Ireland. So what remains? Wales and London. And look what's happened to London. London lived because it was a center, not only of business also, but of culture, of innovation, of meetings. That's gone. Uh, the Chinese don't need to come here anymore. They can learn in China, English, but from Chinese, better than here. So th there will be, I fear, a quick decline. It would be sad, eh? but I didn't see much of a future for the country where I thought I would always live thinking that it was a good idea. Okay, well, on this <laughs> note, uh, let's... Uh, let's... <laughs> Let's you, can move back to it. you can say I'm wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can say I'm wrong, but that's what I think. <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I share some of your views, unfortunately. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. So I invite now Pietro Lyon to Okay, let me oh. just, I want to make it bigger. Ah, okay. Very good. So the floor is yours, so you can you can sit. You sit here tonight. I don't know if we need to give you. I, I think I, I, I can sit. Uh, usually, I have quite a loudly voice. Uh, so that. Um, okay, thank you for the invitation. It's the, actually the first time uh, in, in, at the Institute of Culture. I am probably because uh, I'm <laughs> living a double life uh, in uh, Cambridge uh, in Italy. I'm, I have family in Italy, so I'm commuting weekly, and I'm not coming very frequently um, in London. Um, I am a full professor of uh, computational biology, actually, in the Artificial Intelligence Division of the Department of Computer Science, uh, and I'm also um, a member of uh, this new uh, Cambridge uh, Center for AI Medicine. Actually, this is uh, something uh, um, that, in my opinion, could be also borrowed uh, in Italy, uh, initiatives like the Cambridge Center for AI Medicine, or very similar, the, for instance, there is a, a, a center for Cambridge Zero, Cambridge Zero Energy, and that is uh, associated to a doctorate um, initiative uh, that is about AI and environmental risk. Or there is uh, another initiative uh, of uh, AI and chemistry, which in some sense uh, will lead also later to uh, innovation in material science. I think uh, those kind of uh, directions uh, could be perhaps uh, easy to, uh, to borrow. I studied in Italy and I got uh, two PhDs in Italy and then I moved uh, to, to UK. Uh, let me uh, start uh, with uh, a definition of AI. This is something that uh, I, uh, is from uh, an MIT professor. And artificial intelligence is the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by men or women. And uh, the artificial intelligence uh, is uh, uh, inspired by biology, but in a very superficial way. What we get from biology, we get uh, the connectivity of, some of the, the information are stored uh, in some uh, uh, dispersed entities, the, these uh, neurons that actually are, are sort of very uh, computationally much more simple simpler than uh, the neurons in our, in our brain, uh, and uh, is the connectivity the, the, the real uh, point uh, of uh, the success. Not only that, actually, is the fact how the information is, uh, is passing. I think that in the future we will be able to have uh, a much more uh, uh, important and uh, uh, profound uh, 
uh, inspiration from neuroscience. I would think that uh, uh, we will move to more cognitive architectures uh, and that probably will allow us uh, to interact to interact more with these devices or to have more uh, AI in the loop of our decision making uh, <clears throat> procedures. This is uh, um, something that uh, I will show on the top. The way, for instance, that uh, we, uh, we, we make a diagnosis. There is a CT scan and uh, we look so for some important features. Uh, the features could be, for instance, uh, how narrow are the bones. Uh, they can tell us of inflammatory. Uh, uh, and uh, other feature could be the sort of opacity that we can see in the CT scan. Uh, nothing similar in the uh, AI, particularly in the, in the deep learning. What is happening is actually that uh, uh, the deep learning uh, is learning through examples. So it's not uh, something that uh, we put our brain uh, to identify the reasoning, uh, but uh, we build uh, some general architectures uh, that are learning from examples. This means that uh, it's an artificial intelligence that probably will not make us so much more intelligent, okay? Because uh, is, uh, what uh, is happening is that uh, we lack uh, the interpretability. Usually what we do is to have data and uh, we have an algorithm, we have a recipe, and then we get an output. And uh, it's the same thing that uh, can happen, for instance, to make cookies, uh, because uh, we have uh, the, um, the ingredients uh, and then we have a recipe and uh, everything is in the how good are the ingredients. Uh, and, uh, um, and how the recipe has been tried uh, and passed uh, and, and so on, uh, perhaps uh, through, through different generations. And then we, we, we have the quality of the cookies. In the deep learning, uh, something different. It's like uh, that we have an apprentice. Uh, we show examples of cookies. Uh, we give the ingredients uh, and then we get the output. So in some sense, it's something that uh, is moving uh, through examples. It's like uh, something that we learn uh, through exercise in a natural way. Like for instance, this is why I chose uh, something strange as an example, like uh, a dog that uh, is, uh, is able to capture a frisbee. And this dog probably has not seen, perhaps before the frisbee, was seeing bones, uh, plastic bones, uh, or balls, or whatever. But after, but, uh, the, after a few mistakes, uh, uh, may be able to, to, to capture the frisbee very, very quickly. But uh, there is no a, a sort of uh, computation of uh, the, uh, the equation of motion of the frisbee. Okay, there is no any, a differential equation about uh, the, how the frisbee with the friction of the air will land uh, and uh, what is the best position to, to, uh, to capture. This is why, in some sense, uh, the deep learning uh, is really needs uh, expertise uh, to give examples. Uh, and once uh, we have given examples, uh, then it's, it's a sort of machine, is a sort of device that is ready to use uh, and is very quick. Quickly. So the examples may take a lot of time to, uh, to collect and also to, to train. We, it's like to have an apprentice. So we give an example and we say, this is a good example, this is a bad example, this is a good example. And after a, 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 some time, uh, all the internal parameters, all these uh, nodes that I showed before, uh, will have uh, some values uh, that uh, will allow to uh, make uh, quick decisions like, uh, for instance, uh, where to get the frisbee in, in the air. That kind of things, uh, so the difference between uh, our way, that is to have a recipe and to have ingredients uh, and to get the results, or to, to show the examples, the output, uh, and to give the uh, ingredients, uh, makes uh, the difference. And uh, this difference is actually very impactful, because if we have good examples, uh, the accuracy of these methods are much, much better than the accuracy of uh, our current uh, uh, thoughtful way. Okay, so in some sense, uh, while uh, we, we, we lack in interpretability, but uh, uh, 
the, we can do much better with these automatic systems than using decision trees or linear regression or other methods. Another aspect is that uh, we are actually doing very well when the systems are linear. Okay, we, if this is something that comes from our evolution. It takes uh, uh, perhaps uh, one hour to go to London. It takes uh, two hours to do uh, the double of the distance. But actually, what is happening, particularly in medicine, but everywhere in, in, in the, the world, uh, is something that uh, is non-linear, something that moves uh, in a very different way, more complex. And this is, uh, for instance, our examples about uh, the, the trajectory of dementia with time in X-rays uh, and the cognitive impairment in the Y. This is something, for instance, is part of a project uh, with uh, Maria Grazia about we have a student, uh, and the idea is to use a lot of data, lot of data, to understand uh, what kind of trajectory there will be. Okay, again, the problem is to get good data, then once we have good data, then everything will come. The, why we are successful in, in, in AI? Because the data are becoming very complex. We are not just asking a person to tell us if you are feeling good or bad. Actually, there are many, many different uh, types of variables. For instance, on the top left, uh, you see the in intensive care unit uh, situation uh, and uh, where you have uh, respiratory rates, heart rates, blood glucose, potassium, lymphocytes, uh, and uh, there are so many. You, you have to understand uh, what is important uh, and how they, co they are correlated. Uh, and the correlation importance may change uh, time to time. Uh, and you see that these are only some, but the decision in intensive care unit should be very quick. And at the same time, you need to know also the history of the patient, what is called the uh, electronic health records. So what if there is a familiarity, something that uh, the good family doctor may know, but it doesn't, it doesn't or she doesn't uh, work in that way anymore. At the same time, on the, on the top uh, right, uh, you see, for instance, uh, in one month, uh, you may have good days and bad days. And how can you can put that uh, in a diagnosis that we can handle easy? This is why uh, we have this uh, uh, aspect. For instance, I'm working in Cambridge on, uh, on cancer, and uh, it's particularly breast cancer, and uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of data that are CT scans, uh, NMR, but we have also genomics. And again, uh, the problem is to integrate all the data and to make uh, doctors to be able to interact with the data, but also interact between them, because the doctors have different expertise with different devices. That is something that is bench side, but something similar is uh, lab side, uh, so it's bedside, but also bench side, what is uh, in some sense happening in the lab, where we have a lot of data about genomics or about uh, how which gene is, is, uh, is expressed in different, uh, in different uh, tissues or which proteins. And that is uh, to put together everything is very difficult because it's different scale, different time, different geography of the body, different uh, also accuracy of the, of the tools. This is why we can be a bit lazy and, and have this kind of architecture that we can feed with a lot of data, asking this architecture to, to do uh, most of the job. Particularly nowadays, uh, we are moving medicine towards a more systemic. We are more aware that we cannot see things uh, in a sort of uh, organ-centric. Uh, the organs are cross-talking. Uh, are, we have found the signaling. I just put uh, one example, one uh, image about the liver, but uh, brain, the gut, uh, <coughs> with Maria Grazia, I have learned that, that uh, for instance, uh, um, Parkinson is something that uh, uh, arise uh, uh, two or three decades be be before from the good, something very, very far away. But at the same time, uh, each, uh, um, uh, there are diseases that are changing according to the circadian rhythms and so on. 
another interesting aspect of uh, the, the deep learning, the, uh, which is in some sense, I would say, the cream of AI nowadays, uh, is the fact that it's also generative. If we put, uh, instead of one network, we put two networks and we, we ask them to fight each other, one generates random things and the other say, oh, this is random, I know, and this is other instead is, is true, these two, in this competition, uh, will evolve. The one will be able to generate things that are more likely the reality, and the other will be able to spot what is fake and what is not. So you see, for instance, from this competition, if I give some handwritten, in the, uh, on the right, I put some creativity that is coming, some generative uh, um, uh, uh, fallout of this uh, competition, and uh, they look very similar to the real data. At the same time that uh, nowadays all the fashion catalog that uh, you may see are just fake images. So the ones, uh, the images from from the right are all fakes, and they come from this competition between, between uh, um, uh, um, neural networks, okay? So these neural networks are also something that you make a composition. Is this useful to medicine? Yes, because you can also create synthetic data, and the synthetic data are important because you can make uh, hospitals uh, to share something that would be otherwise very difficult in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, sensitivity. And so the, this kind of uh, what is called the name is federated learning uh, helps a sort of democratization because, uh, for instance, uh, one, something that I learned, uh, particularly in UK, if I, I need to, for instance, to, to do a surgery, I will choose an hospital where that kind of surgery, they do hundreds not uh, tens, okay? Because if they do very, a very small uh, they, uh, um, number of surgeries of that type, uh, they may not have enough experience of, of the kind of uh, um, uh, the, the success rate uh, will be much lower than other places where they are used to do uh, hundreds of thousands. So this kind of uh, synthetic data, although the name sounds uh, quite, uh, uh, quite strange and counterintuitive, are becoming a real treasure in, in medicine. The same, uh, you can generate, for instance, molecules that can uh, occupy and block a certain proteins that is involved perhaps in a disease, in cancer. So this kind of uh, generative power of, of AI is something that now is very at the core of, uh, of uh, uh, chemistry, and there are consortia of uh, uh, people from chemistry and people from AI that are trying to uh, make that uh, on uh, a scale that, uh, uh, so I would think that uh, the future, uh, probably uh, co successful companies uh, will come from uh, a combined efforts from chemists and, uh, and AI. The same, for instance, you can use the same principle of uh, um, creativity through um, competition between, uh, between uh, architectures uh, to increase uh, the resolution of images. It's the same principle of creativity, but in this case uh, you are able to increase the resolution. And if you increase the resolution, it means that you see better. And if you see better, you can discriminate uh, in a, a glioblastoma what to cut uh, in order to avoid the tumor to bounce back quickly, but to assure as much uh, quality of life for the patient. This is something that, uh, for instance, we have applied on COVID and, and other disease uh, that is uh, um, to, to try to understand better the, the kind of spread. In the the, uh, what uh, I am interested in using this generative power in also to generate hypothesis, diagnosis, not to just to find confirmation. This is because uh, one of the problems in medicine is to understand counterfactuals, to understand, uh, to measure the uncertainty. What we know is this, what is certain, but what we are not uh, 
uh, so able to do is to make a, a good estimate of the uncertainty. And that is something that uh, this generative power of AI is able to do. That uh, also comes uh, because uh, better support decision systems uh, will also uh, make uh, um, decisions that are really crucial in our life, particularly uh, towards the end of our life, or in uh, when, in some sense, the decision between don't treat or uh, using existing therapies or experimental therapies are quite crucial, and sometimes they depend on the experience of the doctors. For instance, uh, there are so many variables, again, uh, and uh, to belong to a certain uh, class of patterns uh, or clusters uh, will make a very different outcome uh, in the, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, on uh, the, the uh, ICU, the intensive care unit. This is something, for instance, uh, that I'm doing with Andrea, and uh, it's something uh, that uh, is a project called CHARM, and uh, the idea is uh, to have a biopsy from a patient, and sometimes uh, it takes a lot of time between the biopsy and the actual surgery. This time uh, could be really shortened. So you take the biopsy and you look uh, at the cell as a sort of, the tissue as a sort of uh, network of cells. And these network of cells uh, can tell you a lot about processes that, for instance, uh, are growing in, uh, in a very, in a, in a natural way according to the geometries of the body. So that uh, uh, the idea with a group in Cambridge, with me, Andrea, and also Luigi Occhipinti, and, a, and uh, Matteo Negro uh, with a spin-off, but a, a group, uh, for instance, Polytechnic of Milano and uh, somebody in, 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 in Germany, is to have a microscopy, a microscope inside the surgery theater. That will shorten everything if the decision is very quick, and the deep learning can, once it's trained, is quick. Once it's trained with good example, is extremely quick, quick in seconds. This means that uh, we can give the right uh, suggestions to the doctor. We don't want to replace the doctor. We want to have AI in the loop, but this uh, could be something that uh, will make uh, the, the process very quick. There are other innovations, one that is very, very important, it's come from a lot of uh, studies that actually started from graphene, eh, is the fact that uh, with uh, using not only the visible, but using the Raman spectroscopy, we can detect aspects like uh, macro environments uh, in a better way, and it's very, very novel, and it will lead to uh, a revolution in the field. Finally, uh, what is my dream project? Cambridge. Well, uh, something that uh, is now at the center of the technology, the industrial technology, in, uh, uh, and it will make probably a revolution, is the concept of digital twin. Imagine that uh, you can uh, code uh, and your airplane in, uh, in your computer, you in all the parts, in the structural part, the, the, the hydraulic, the electronic, the, all the parts, you assemble and you can test. You can test in different atmospheric conditions, in different aspects of failure, how in some sense uh, you can do. And then you send all this to a farm where there are uh, 3D printers, where there are robots can assemble. Obviously, you don't want uh, to avoid testing, but at least you will not make all the stupid mistakes that has happened in your computer, so it's not costed a lot of money, okay? And this is something that we are starting to do, putting together data and equations from different parts of the body, but also from different scale of the body, from DNA to, uh, to, to, um, or to cells, to tissue, to organs, and so on, to try to understand the arise of comorbidities, for instance, the possibility that to understand why a person with type 2 diabetes is more at risk to get a rheumatoid arthritis, and vice versa. This is something that uh, we got already something uh, interesting. I will not go into, into details, but uh, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, 
it will fight against also the education in, in, of physicians. Uh, um, the education is something very compartmentalized because you have a physician uh, educated and trained to in uh, metabolic disease or in, uh, in uh, endocrinology and so on. So we are trying to do something that uh, it could be a sort of, uh, uh, it could be seen as uh, really uh, something uh, outrageous for the medical establishment, but actually there is more and more cross-talk and, and this is leading to understanding better the, and to establish also trajectory that uh, to understand how from a healthy condition, and it's not just a point because we are all different, is a region, you get into a, a, a disease uh, state, at the same time how you can revert this and to, to, to assure a sort of quality of, of life. And this is something that happens uh, you can even understand the expression at the genes level in the different cells. There are projects in, in all the world, but particularly in Cambridge, there, there is a, 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 a lot of initiatives about making a cell atlas over the body so that that will give us an opportunity to derive a medicine that is uh, um, cell-based and it will be more precision-based, even if in some sense the, the other aspect, population-based, particularly for the, the fact that the, uh, most of the world actually is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, in, uh, in starvation condition is equally important. This is something where we predict cancer, and I will skip this, and... Uh, immunity, immune system, how it works with the inflammation. That is something that uh, we are just doing now. And, uh, and uh, the idea is to understand uh, phenomenon like inflammation, how inflammation and aging are together. This is uh, from uh, the word, uh, the terminology is from a friend in Bologna, Claudio Franceschi, uh, is professor of pathology, uh, or immunosenescence, how he calls it. And uh, something that uh, from uh, a single tissue you don't see very well, but putting together evidences from different tissues, you start to understand it better. I, <clears throat> I think that medicine is not just a physician job. Uh, there are data scientists, uh, people in engineering and so on. So I would say that uh, is, uh, is something that uh, will require a, a putting together um, experiences. At the same time, uh, AI is something similar, so we, we really need to have a, a much better awareness and a more um, understanding of how we can increase the interpretability, but also we can have trustworthy and ethics into this. And this will come from uh, explaining to, for instance, to have, um, I, I gave uh, uh, a talk very similar to uh, Futuro Remoto in Naples last year, for instance, to and we were uh, students from a Liceum. I gave uh, a talk uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Bari. Was, I don't remember now. In, uh, so in some sense, uh, in my opinion, to train teachers uh, in the schools would be equally good uh, as uh, to, to, to impact uh, on, uh, on uh, PhD student and other. Even if uh, I was involved, uh, I gave a seminar three months ago in, uh, in Rome to the National uh, um, AI uh, Doctorate, which, and I found a really uh, very motivated and interested student. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, okay, thank you very much for your talk. So, are there questions for Pietro? Over there, yeah. Here. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, my name is uh, David Buchan, uh, a former journalist, Financial Times. Um, my question is uh, sort of non medical, really, or non technical. It's about the impact of Brexit. Uh, on um, uh, perhaps in general, if you have a general view of the impact on the 
the scientific collaboration between the UK and, uh, and its exclusion from the Horizon programme, and in particular for you, is it a handicap at all, you working in a British university? No. So, I, I think that uh, it's different probably to be in Cambridge or uh, Oxford or Imperial. And for instance, I've seen more friends, uh, colleagues from Newcastle leaving and going back uh, uh, to La Sapienza or, or other uh, Italian universities. So uh, I think there is a, a, this distinction. Uh, yes, I, I was very disappointed because now that uh, I think that I am the, at the edge of a career, I would have got many, many more uh, uh, interest uh, and, and links. Uh, uh, so I have uh, actually three European projects, uh, and uh, uh, one is uh, with, with Andrea. But uh, 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 yes, I think that uh, this is, uh, I think everything will, will, uh, will go away when I will be retired, so in some sense, <laughs> what I can do. In my opinion, from the practical point of view, uh, I have uh, uh, two visitors from Italy and uh, I have uh, to sign in some sense also uh, without making too much noise in my department uh, for other four visitors coming uh, from Italy ne uh, in the next months. Uh, so I am uh, keeping a lot of, uh, and usually they, they are these, for instance, are from Genova and from Rome. They are the one contacting me. Uh, so I'm trying to, to, to do my best uh, to, to keep, and I see there is uh, a lot of interest. But uh, I think for other universities, may, maybe something they may struggle a bit more. And, uh, and also, I like the breadth of the European grants. I really like uh, the, to meet people across Europe. That is uh, really the sense of, uh, of Europe. Uh, it's beautiful, you know? it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a reality that has been, uh, we, we had uh, 100 years war, we had 30 years war. Okay, now that we can do things in a, in a so beautiful way, it's changing and see people around is, uh, is I'm really, uh, feeling bad to be on this other side. I've been a reviewer in Brussels, and honestly, uh, it was, even if uh, in the last few days there has been some problems about Italian in Brussels, but uh, is, uh, I, I, all my experience in Brussels has been extremely positive. Not only has uh, uh, going there to, for an interview for a grant, but as a reviewer, all the people I met there, both working in the administration and uh, coming there as a reviewer, well, I, I think it has been one of the most beautiful experiences. I've been, I was particularly in a program called CAPS for bottom-up startup and so on, and uh, that has been, I, 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 I think that has been probably one of the most beautiful experiences in my life. So that is something that I regret for the British people. Okay, I will try to, to get something for myself in the future anyway. What about to you? Okay. Well, yes, uh, first of all, thank you. And being a physician of diagnostic imaging, I really think that this method is going to change our work in a better way. So we, we will have the time to be really the physician, not the one who looks, has to look uh, of thousands of images without understanding much. So I really think so. But I have a, a very small question about your digital twin. Is that a digital patient or a digital body? It's no, it's not. I think that uh, it's true that uh, there are a lot of uh, ways to get uh, through sensors. Uh, for instance, uh, you may have a patient at home uh, and uh, even from the gate uh, or other kind of uh, um, uh, environmental uh, or body sensors, you get something. It's, it's very important uh, that uh, the patient is, uh, is uh, aware of everything, uh, is also uh, aware of a kind of data that is giving, uh, but I think uh, that uh, um, we need uh, a lot of cross-talk, uh, and uh, this technique uh, should not be automatic, uh, 
but uh, in my opinion may save life. For instance, uh, assessing the priority. Let's say during COVID, one of the problems was that uh, a lot of uh, um, surgeries or therapies for cancer has been delayed. And the kind of priority of a different patient that was not uh, easy to assess, there has been mathematical models and so on. I think uh, this kind of, uh, a lot of data that could, that could come from uh, the environment of a, of a patient at all, or even from, uh, uh, for instance, uh, my, uh, Saturday my, was the birthday of my mother and she was uh, in the emergency yard in, in Florence. Uh, and she, she went there and I was not there. And she went there at nine o'clock uh, and she, uh, she stayed till 10 o'clock in the evening. And uh, we thought, and the doctors saw her at 10 o'clock. So in some sense, uh, in between, uh, she would have said, yes to a digital twin uh, in order to, to feed of information of these doctors, okay? So it's upset. So there are some circumstances in which uh, it is good, but I don't want to sell you anything uh, in a sort of black box, okay? So that uh, we, we, can, we sit and we talk, uh, but it's good that there is a technology, and then we, 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 we look at what are the best way to deploy it. Okay. okay, Pietro, thank you very much. Uh, we move to the... We move to the last talk. many years is an expert on uh, on land surface processes on coupled processes the processes that we need to simulate in models that are used to predict the weather and to study the climate so Gian Paolo Basso thank you thank you very much Roberto and thank you very much to all the organizing committees really my pleasure to be here and to present before this uh, excellent audience and and uh, excellent panel um, my work to uh, really help on the side of climate change. So we heard about, in the previous talk, we could say they're all life-changing life and life-saving. And here I wanted to, to bring you on the topic of climate change, which is also a life-saving topic. Um, what I'm going to present to you is the CO2 human emission and the Paris Agreement. So the steps towards monitoring the carbon emission uh, for the sustainability of uh, uh, our planet. So first of all, what is the Paris Agreement? So I have uh, uh, here a short video. We'll see if it plays. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate uh, very quickly uh, the Paris Agreement, which is a, a very important tool we have, and it's, it's really a success of uh, uh, human coordination to have such, a, such an agreement. It's an agreement for climate action. And uh, here, a few words. What is the Paris Agreement? The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. This requires economic and social transformation to face the climate challenges now and moving into the future based on the best available science. The Paris Agreement works on a five-year cycle of increasingly ambitious climate action. By 2020, countries communicate their plans known as nationally determined contributions. Countries communicate actions they will take to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. 
Countries also communicate actions they will take to build resilience to adapt to the impacts of rising temperatures. This may include information on adaptation and finance flows. The Paris Agreement also provides a framework for financial, technical and capacity building support to those countries who need it. Starting in 2024, countries report transparently on actions taken. Collective progress under the Paris Agreement will be assessed through a global stock take. This will lead to recommendations for countries to set more ambitious plans in the next round. So, basically, in, in short, this gives you the framework. So, it's a key achievement of 2015. So, the Paris Agreement goes back seven years ago. Um, 196 countries have signed it, so almost the entire planet. Um, it works in five-year cycle, and uh, it's um, really bringing forward to enhance the transparency. So um, climate change as a reality is uh, uh, brought by human action, and uh, so the Paris Agreement provides finally a framework to act on it. It will assess the progress in, um, in this five-year cycle with uh, thanks to global stock takes, which is an exercise that involved all those 196 nations to really monitor what are the CO2 emissions. And then they will set new ambitious targets. So uh, um, this comes from the fact that uh, um, particularly what I show you today is one of the, uh, it's the European approach to uh, support the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And the European Commission has realized uh, uh, around the 2015 that uh, uh, in order to be serious about taking uh, climate action, we need to measure what, uh, what CO2 emission, what carbon emission are being released into the atmosphere. So it goes uh, without saying that, you know, one cannot manage what is not measured. You know, I have the fortune to work with uh, great managers in, uh, uh, in my career. I mean, Roberto Buizza is uh, one example. I, I worked under his leadership at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. And uh, here is really a recognition of, uh, for CO2, in order to be tackled as a challenge, one needs to monitor and verify the emissions that we all emit thanks, well, thanks, because of our human activities. There is not a single activity of industry or, uh, you know, mobility or uh, construction that is not associated with CO2 emissions. So everything we do in, in society has an associated CO2 emission. Um, it is very important, the choice of words here. So it is called a CO2 monitoring and verification support capacity. So CO2 is also a very contentious uh, area. Uh, so this is presented as a support to the nation to, uh, to really help them achieve the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. And um, uh, the European Commission has mandated the ECMWF, so the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, which is the organi organization I work for, to coordinate the global aspect. I've been coordinating uh, a first uh, um, pioneering project on that, and this is now moving towards operational implementation. Now, will we be able to tackle climate change? It's really, you know, I always ask this question myself, and there is a good precedent in history, and we should all be aware of that. We've been able to tackle the problem of the ozone hole. So in 1987, Countries came together, realized the problem of the ozone hole. They came together in what was called the Montreal Protocol. They decided that it was time to cure, to, to, to go towards a healing of the plan, planet to remove what was causing the ozone hole. And now we can look back at those decisions with, with our monitoring capacity and the ozone hole is restoring. So there is a good precedent in history in which the nation came together and were able to uh, rectify and correct um, a human action which was destroying the environment. So the ozone hole is really one example I always like to cite because there is a precedent of success. Now, climate change is a much more difficult uh, uh, problem because it is really in every aspect of human activities that CO2 emissions are uh, present. 
So the uh, European Commission has put a grant project in, uh, in action. So uh, starting from 2015, so the CO2 um, task force was formed in order to really prepare the grounds. And you have to imagine a really a large amount of, of uh, funding and also people and organization being involved in this project. And it has really a long breadth of activity going towards 2026 here on this graph, but well beyond. So basically the first element were the research. So are we able to monitor the CO2 uh, at global scale? Can we do that technologically and scientifically? So ECNWF, so the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, together with the European Space Agencies and the European uh, Meteorological Satellite Organization, were tasked to really come together and, and provide a, an action plan for this. So we are roughly midway in this action plan, and I'll show you some results on where we are right now. So. really uh, be at the far front of nuclear energy uh, research. And the European Center for Medium Range uh, Weather Forecast has been a success story for Europe for weather prediction and climate monitoring. So this is one of the reasons why ECNWF was tasked to coordinate these activities. But what makes uh, possible to um, monitor CO2 and monitor the weather and the climate from space for, for instance, this is an example of, uh, of a satellite overlooking the Earth. So there are three ingredients, three elements uh, in um, making possible to do uh, uh, weather prediction and uh, also to establish the pillars for climate monitoring. The first one is observation. The second one is to have models capable of representing the Earth system. So we have heard in the um, presentation of uh, Professor Liu the concept of digital twins. There is exactly the same concept in, in weather and climate. So we are trying to reproduce a digital twin of the planet so that we can describe the past and then using the equation of motion, predict the future. And Earth system model do that. And then uh, the third element, which is not... Uh, uh, um, really uh, a small one, is really a key important pillar, is supercomputing. So we have heard in the, in the presentation of uh, Professor Messa the uh, achievement of the Bologna supercomputer, which is, uh, is also the, the Technopole in Bologna, is also the location where the ECNWF is running its weather forecast daily since uh, around a month. So we have moved from uh, England to Italy all our operations in terms of uh, um, uh, computation. And this is the third very important ingredient in order to make it possible to, to predict the weather and monitor the climate. When we talk about the observations, we have to think about in, in hundreds of millions. So uh, at ECNWF, we receive around 300 million observations per day which are um, provided by satellite, which are either polar orbiting, so they do North Pole, South Pole in continuous, or they are geostationary. So we have seen geostationary, we see geostationary satellite every day on TV when we see this animation of weather <laughs> over Europe. So the combination of satellite with uh, balloons, with airplane, with in situ, with boats, with uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, information on the ground, radars, and, and all sorts of uh, 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 automatic and managed we weather station. We receive all this data, and then we assimilate this data in order to produce a picture, uh, a three-dimensional picture of the state of the planet in terms of its temperature, its wind, its humidity, and uh, um, uh, monitor really the evolution of this uh, quantity over time. And we surely monitor also the chemistry of the planet. So also the, the CO2 is uh, uh, possible to, to, to really represent and monitor. But we don't have as many observations for the carbon aspect. So this was one identified challenge. We had a lot of observation for the weather, not so much for the uh, CO2. 
Right, you see here an example of the observation we receive every day. So for instance, this is uh, on the um, top left, you see uh, the um, uh, example over, over the ground, so station of the ground. They all arrive at the same time in, uh, um, at our center and they get assimilated. Here you see, uh, you see um, airplane trajectory, for instance. So each airplane, when it take off and land, it measures the uh, temperature of the atmosphere. And here you see a typical trajectory of a satellite, a polar orbiting satellite, so going North Pole, South Pole. So it will measure a trajectory like that in, in several uh, different channels, so uh, visible, infrared, microwave. So all these observations are used to uh, create a picture of the weather. Now, can we do the same for uh, carbon? And can we do the same for uh, the greenhouse gases in general? Now, for greenhouse gases, it is much more difficult to uh, detect the signal. So we measure, we measure CO2 very well on the, on the ground. So particularly, you, you, you might have seen this kind of curve here. It's a famous Keeling curve for uh, climate change, which is measured in uh, a station like uh, over the Mauna Loa uh, uh, Island in Hawaii or, or in Australia, so stations which are very much far apart from, uh, from industry and from uh, emissions, so they can measure the background CO2. But we don't measure very well in cities, or we don't measure very well uh, the emission of a given industry sector. For those, there is a lot of work to be, to be done. Um, so we know that in the global uh, scale, we are emitting more and more CO2 every year. We know that this is not limited to CO2, but also methane and uh, um, nitrous oxide, which are all greenhouse gases. They are all climate uh, effective, so they are all warming the planet. They are all em emitted, uh, and there is a trend to increase. So all these curves really show you the seriousness of climate change. So every year, we emit more and more. So uh, the Paris Agreement is really trying to uh, stop this curve to grow, uh, reach a plateau, and then stabilize the CO2 emission. And the same, it has to be done for the other uh, emission. We know from the International Panel of Climate Change that the two most important gases are carbon dioxide and methane. They are changing our climate, and they are changing it in a way which is perceivable. So um, the, the, the ice is melting, uh, uh, both the polar regions and the, uh, um, the ice sheet over land. Uh, there is an increase of temperature of about 1, one degree, 1.1 degree in the last uh, uh, 150 years. So um, all these uh, climate uh, um, effects are really due to uh, the greenhouse gases. So uh, it's, a, it's a human induced um, global warming. So this is really a very recent result from the uh, International Panel on Climate Change. And uh, we have to do something about it. There's no doubt that this is the, the defining issue of our time to, um, to stop, to mitigate and stop climate change. Um, this is a sketch on how the uh, greenhouse gas, the carbon dioxide, which is we, we always name shortly in CO2, how the CO2 is exchanged between the atmosphere and the land. So we measure it very well over the atmosphere, but it's actually caused by uh, you know, our industry emitting CO2. Um, deforestation, where whenever we cut uh, in, a, in a large amount of forest, we, we basically subtract what the nature can do to, to absorb CO2, therefore we increase the emission. And then there is also a good action from the ocean which absorbs some of the CO2. Um, this is a sketch for the, for the greenhouse gases, the methane. So we know, we know a lot about methane these days because of its price in, in, the, in the energy uh, crisis. Uh, however, there is a natural cycle of, of methane as well. Methane is also part of agriculture uh, emission, in particular farming, is also contained in the permafrost, so all the uh, frozen land contain methane, which can be released and increase the climate change effect. And therefore, we have to simulate and model these processes to create a digital twin of, of the planet. So similarly to uh, what we heard about earlier, so we want to create a, a, a digital twin 
uh, to be able to monitor uh, the CO2 emission. Nir, I have another short bit video. We burn fossil fuels, carbon dioxide builds in the atmosphere, the climate warms. It's essentially that simple. It's a bit loud, I don't know if it's... Uh... We burn fossil fuels, carbon dioxide builds in the atmosphere, the climate warms. It's essentially that simple. In 2018, CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere reached 410 parts per million for the first time in recorded history. This graph shows two pieces of information. The black line depicts the overall upwards trend caused by human activities. The red zigzag shows the increases and decreases caused by the Earth's natural carbon cycle. Understanding the dynamics of atmospheric CO2 is key to combat climate change. Following the Paris Agreement, 177 countries have pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and as a result a transparent system to monitor and report CO2 emissions is required. As existing observation networks do not meet these requirements, report-based estimates following strict international guidelines are currently used. Copernicus, the European Union's Earth Observation Program, plans to build a support capacity to consistently monitor anthropogenic CO2 emissions combining in situ and satellite observations with detailed models of the atmosphere and biosphere. The proposed Sentinels will have better performance and coverage than current satellites to achieve worldwide monitoring of CO2 emissions. The support capacity will enable 1. The detection of emitting hotspots 2. The monitoring of the hotspots emissions to assess emission reductions 3. Detailed data at a regional level for the assessment of emissions changes against local reduction targets. 4. The assessment of national emissions changes in five-year steps to estimate global impact. Copernicus has an excellent track record of turning science into services and will deliver an observation-based CO2 service which will constitute an essential tool for the European Union to help the world in combating climate change. Okay, this, this really is just to fix the concept you heard so far. And um, so there is, there is you, you will hear about this system because this system is, is being deployed and it will help the implementation of the Paris Agreement. This is really a plan which has a, a long target. So in 2050, the European Union wants to be climate neutral. Therefore, the CO2, the situation that is now where we are emitting CO2 has to change. So there are enormous societal changes which are going to be put in place in order to achieve these uh, this climate targets. And, and there is a plan to do it. So um, here you see um, a bit of results. So um, I've been leading a first project between 2017 and 2020. Uh, at the time, this was uh, uh, the equivalent of uh, 28 years of research done in three. So this is the number of people we have hired uh, across uh, uh, 20, more than 20 uh, institutes, was 22 partners across Europe, in order to come together and build a European monitoring capacity for anthropogenic CO2. And really, the, the why is really to support the Paris Agreement implementation. Um, I'm now part of a new project, which will extend uh, uh, up to 2020-23. We raised our investment, so about 76 years of research in this uh, framework. So uh, it's even bigger in terms of uh, uh, consortium. We have 25 partners. We have heard earlier about the beauty of, of European uh, um, uh, intelligence coming together, and this is uh, another example for, for the climate. And... Uh, so this is just a, a, an example of the, um, of the consortium. And then what we were able to achieve in this first project is really to try to visualize CO2. What I told you earlier, that you cannot monitor what you don't measure. And also CO2, we don't see it, right? So it's, it's part of our planet, but it's not visible. But thanks to computers and thanks to models, it can be made visible. So here, what you see is one year of CO2, the 2015, uh, simulated by one of the most powerful computers and running at the highest resolution we are capable of. So this is a nine-kilometer global simulation for the CO2. 
So the red concentration you, hear, you see here, you know, it's winter time, so you see the northern hemisphere emit a lot of CO2. These are, are our industry emit, emitting CO2. They go up to, into the atmosphere. The CO2 concentration get advected by the weather, so the weather modulates the CO2 uh, concentration. Here it comes uh, uh, spring and summer. So in spring and summer, nature comes to help us. So the vegetation absorbs CO2, and then you see a lot of green here. So this is a lot of uh, negative anomalies. So the, the planet is absorbing again CO2. And that's why the reason you see that that curve is going up and down, up and down in winter and summer. So the summer is really good to, uh, in the northern hemisphere, all the vegetation, all the trees, uh, are absorbing CO2 and reducing the concentration. So we have a powerful ally in, in combating climate change, which is nature. In fact, you, you, you hear a lot about nature-based solution for climate change. It's really using the planet to, uh, to try to equilibrate this process. So CO2 need to be managed. And uh, here, I can skip, this is really how the um, transport works, so really, uh, that's why a weather model is really a good uh, framework in which you can build the uh, CO2 monitoring system, because we, ACWF is, is the world leader in, in, in weather prediction. Uh, apologize for the snow today, so yeah, if you have one to blame, it's really the modelers uh, of, the, of the weather. Um, and um, so we model the, the CO2 as we model the weather in a, in a three-dimensional fashion. So we also model from the surface to the stratosphere. So really the entire volume of the atmosphere is monitored. And, and then we can look really at cross-sections of uh, this CO2 concentration where, you know, the high concentration are at the surface where there are the industry emissions, for instance, and then we have a lower concentration going up into the atmosphere. Um, what, yeah, five minutes, yeah. So what we want to achieve is to be able to uh, predict the CO2 concentration as we predict the weather. And then being able to uh, make it actionable to, to really uh, measure who is emitting when and supporting the nation in the ambition of the climate, uh, of the Paris Agreement, the climate uh, accord. Um, we are going to be helped by satellites. So a satellite is being uh, built as we speak. So it's really a very fast uh, uh, um, endeavor uh, from the European space agencies. So um, it's gonna be called CO2M, so for, for the monitoring mission. So it will be able to monitor CO2 at unprecedented resolution of a two by two kilometer. So this is really important. So resolution, we heard it, how it's important to detect uh, uh, um, a small cell in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the medicine. Well, it's important here to detect small emission and, and uh, industry are emitting at the point source. So this satellite will be able to detect, uh, for instance, a, uh, a single uh, power station. Here you have an example over Germany where this can be detected. Here is another example over South Africa where you see the satellite overpass is detecting a, a strong CO2 emission from a power station. Um, obviously nothing happened only thanks to science. Science needs to really communicate and uh, needs uh, user engagement. So in order to, to be successful in deploying this, this program, there is really a large program of uh, uh, user engagement, uh, which involve uh, the United Nations Framework for Climate Change, all the national inventories uh, agencies, uh, national observatories, and the science is feeding into these Copernicus services, which are, are a reality of, the, uh, of Europe being united and developing those monitoring services. Um, I will uh, close. This is my last uh, slide, and I, I wanted to show you a future vision where this satellite will be launched in 2026, so we will see it very soon. Uh, everything is on time, so there's been a lot of pressure to launch this constellation of satellites, and here you get an idea of how it will work. Global warming, the most pressing issue of our time. 
nations of the world stand together through the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and aim to limit the global temperature increase to no more than 2 degrees Celsius. This is why Europe is planning to launch a series of new satellites to measure the concentrations of carbon dioxide, CO2, in the atmosphere, the most important man-made greenhouse gas contributing to climate change. cities and industries are now taking action to reduce emissions, but it's difficult for them to judge whether their measures are successful. The new satellites will help them in doing that. They will produce images of the CO2 plumes of large sources, such as cities and power plants. Images that can then be used to quantify emissions. CO2 concentrations are increasing globally due to human activity. CO2 from densely populated areas is then transported over long distances and can be detected hundreds of kilometers downwind, for example over the Atlantic Ocean. The satellites will fly in a sun-synchronous orbit, which means that they will always measure at the same time of day in the late morning. A single satellite can only cover a small part of the globe. The three satellites, shown here in different colors, will therefore fly in constellation to observe the entire globe within only a few days. Let's monitor an area over Poland and Germany with its power plants and a large city like Berlin. Because clouds are often blocking the view, many satellite overpasses are needed to estimate emissions with sufficient accuracy. The satellites will measure with a very high resolution and can zoom into any region of the world. Every single pixel has the size of 2 by 2 kilometers. This is needed to create an image of the plumes from individual sources. With this monitoring system, we can contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately help preserve our planet. And this is all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this uh, overview of what's being built, actually, as we as we speak. So, are there questions for Gianpaolo from the audience? Yes. Thank you very much. That was very beautiful. I, I have a curiosity, probably it's naivety, but I attended a few years ago a um, conference on uh, world emergency, and there were a lot of scientists from Los Alamos. From, and they were claiming that uh, all this warming was not related only to CO2, but was a normal cycle in our health. And now, last week, we, we read in Nature that they found this in the ecosystem, the DNA of uh, uh, animals in Greenland, where at that time there was no ice, and they lived together like now they live in the equator almost. So can you please clarify for a naive person what all this means? Thank you. Yeah, the, the majority, so the consensus in the climate change uh, science community, uh, we're talking about you know, 98% of uh, the scientists is really that there hasn't been in history of the planet a period like this one. So we are beyond what we have experienced through natural cycles of, uh, of carbon dioxide. So uh, basically we are, we are into untapped territories. So, and, and the reason it's, it's very much possible to show with the models that uh, if we remove the CO2 in the models, we don't get this uh, warming. So including CO2 is really showing how correlated is the eating to, uh, to really the CO2 uh, human emission. There are other effects, so for instance, the solar cycle, uh, there has been a period where um, this, the sun was 
a little bit brighter and there are periods where there has been um, more pollution in the air, but nothing match the CO2. So it's really thanks to those models, you can really remove one by one the process and the only one which gets this killing curve of uh, uh, climate change warming is the CO2. So CO2 is number one. And then uh, there are the other gases. So the methane is also growing at an increasingly high rate. So all those greenhouse gases are uh, responsible of the warming. It doesn't, doesn't exclude that there are other natural effects, but they are minor compared to uh, the human emission. So we are, we are making it and we, it's a good news because the fact that we are making it is also uh, a, a sign that we could undo this change. So uh, revert. If it was a natural cycle, then that's it. We can't do anything about it. You know, we are we are responsible for for the CO two emission for the climate change. So we have to be responsible of the solution. So last question. Uh, yes. So the videos were really fascinating. The movies, it's, particularly the first one you showed about. Uh, the seasonal variation of the emission and because it showed something one would not expect. So there were emissions concentrated in the winter, in the Northern Hemisphere winter, in South Sah Sah Saharan Africa and corresponding areas. And of course, there was a huge amount in India and China, whereas in Europe and North America probably was there, but slightly less concentrated. So the question is, why are these things happening and are we doing the right things, you know, in uh, tackling climate change. So the the northern hemisphere uh, emission. Uh, I really like that video. I show it all the time because it's it's really one of the main achievement of this uh, this project. Uh, over the northern hemisphere, the emission, as you pointed out, are mainly industry driven. In in Africa, in the sub-Saharan Africa, there, there and also in uh, South America, uh, they are fire emission. So whenever you have, and there you have really massive fires. So it's it's a huge emission from uh, natural and anthropogenic because fires is very much also uh, uh, human induced effect. So it's it's uh, it's used for uh, agriculture. So it's really part of uh, uh, human action in those areas. So there is is fire. So in order to be able to really simulate. Uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you have to account for every possible source. But uh, as, as you pointed out, they, there are different uh, sources, both natural and anthropogenic. And then the natural is very important because it's also offer an absorption. So both the ocean and the, the forest in particular are able to uh, absorb CO2. They use it to build their own leaves, their, their own biomass. So they are our allies in order to stabilize the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So that's, um, yeah, it's really a complex and diverse uh, modeling uh, uh, system there. Thank you, Gianpaolo. So thank you very much to the three speakers again. Now we have a 15 minutes comfort break and then we will have uh, award ceremonies of uh, seven awards given to young researchers, Italian researchers and scientists. Uh, they will have a awards will be given by the ambassador and by representative of the four sponsors and made it possible. After that, we will uh, we will give also the floor to the seven winners to talk about their research for five, five minutes each, and then seven o'clock we will go upstairs where there are some drinks and kind of thing. So uh, back here at uh, five fifteen, please on time.
Sorry, I want to check whether all the uh, winners are here. So Sara, I met Sara. Uh, Miriam is represented by Serena. Michele Mack, perfect. Uh, Diego Panici, perfect. And Giulia Tozzi, very good. And uh, I've seen Anarita and Lorenzo, so you're ready to go. Thank you for being here. Catherine. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief because we got to the moment that we're all been waiting for tonight, the prize giving ceremony. And uh, so a renewed welcome to all of you. Uh, and it's a, an enormous pleasure to uh, be able to uh, host the awards of talented young scientists and talented young Italians for the prizes of Italy Made Me and Il Circolo Science Award. So without further ado, I leave the floor to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Italy, Inigo Lambertini. Thank you. Now, thank you. It's my enormous pleasure to be here tonight uh, to, to award uh, uh, young talents. And uh, that's very important. That's very, maybe, maybe because I'm, I'm young in a different way, but I, for me, I'm really touching for me to participate tonight at this event. Of course, uh, a warm welcome to, to, to Cristina Messa. We, we work uh, together. Uh, we remember our time in Rome. It's always a pleasure to, to meet you. To Professor uh, Piero Baglioni, to Professor Andrea Ferrari uh, and Pietro Lio, mm, to Simonetta Agnello, Orbi e Giampaolo uh, Balsamo, Bals Balsamo, I hope that, <laughs> sì. um, um, I also take this opportunity to, to welcome the Professor Carla Molteni and the uh, Professor Paolo Radelli, President and Secretary of the Association of Italia Scientists in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's really an honor. I know that it, Always people say that it's really an honor, it's a real pleasure, but for me it's really an honor tonight to speak and to participate at this event. Um, I'm very proud to uh, hand over this award to Italian researchers operating successfully in the UK and the recognition of their innovative research work. As maybe you know, the, uh, we have a, a long standing and even uh, stronger in the last year, uh, traditional high-level presence of Italian uh, uh, researchers, Italian professor, Italian, excellent Italian living in, in the UK. Uh, there are some slight problems. I don't need to, 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 to elaborate. I don't need to, 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 to explain. Uh, so my duty is to confirm against any other odd situation, the uh, excellence of this uh, tradition. And this is sure a moment very important for confirm this. Thank you for having me tonight and uh, I'm ready to, to follow this direction. <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, so this is how we are going to play it. Um, first of all, I would like really to say a couple of words and to thank the sponsors who made this uh, prizes possible. I will then give a the floor to the four sponsors so that they can say a few words about them, about why they, they've been sponsoring these prizes. And then we will go through the by the ambassador and the sponsor. We will give a floor to the seven candidates. Six are here, one has sent us a video so that we can hear a little bit about their story and what they're doing. Okay, so before I give a floor to the four sponsors, let me just say that uh, uh, the Italy made me awards, uh, very important awards that the Italian Embassy presents to Italian researchers operating in the United Kingdom who received it part of their, uh, in, in fact, part due to their education in Italy and part in recognition of innovative research conducted in uh, free, the three macro, uh, uh, macro categories of uh, the European Research Council, life sciences, physical engineering sciences, and social sciences and humanities. So this year, thanks to the sponsor, we have five 
uh, prizes to, to hand over. Um, the sponsors will get in contact directly with the winners to hand over a prize of £1,000. Uh, we will give them here now a certificate. After this, uh, uh, we will also celebrate the two winners of the Circolo uh, Science Award 2022. So, first step, uh, I'll give the floor to the four sponsors, and then uh, we will do the ceremony. So, I invite, uh, first of all, uh, Professoressa Teresa Maria Fiotti of University College London, who represents the David Y. Mason Foundation. So, Teresa, if you want to come and say a few words, you're welcome. Well, thank you very much, and um, I represent David Mason Foundation. Uh, just a few words, David Mason Foundation was established in 2010. Um, David Mason was a professor uh, of hematology and cellular pathology at the University of Oxford, and he pioneered the production of monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies that um, are uh, worldwide used for diagnostic of cancer and um, also um, he um, uh, developed a technique that established that allows the detection of cancer antigens so it's a pleasure for me to give the to sponsor dr campinotti yeah okay yes? yeah. okay thank you thank you I'll... Ah. So now I would like to call Giorgia Bacco. Giorgia Bacco from Dr. Elando is not here. Okay. So then I want to invite Eduardo Nogueira, who is represented Pirelli. So Eduardo, if you want to say a few words about Pirelli involvements with uh, maybe. Hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, happy to, to be here with you and represent uh, the group Pirelli, a company with more than 150 years old and um, very Italian company and uh, in UK, very strong presence and um, very glad to be here. Um, it's in our DNA, so investment in research and development and the technology and assure that uh, all this kind of uh, uh, initiatives can recognize uh, is a small symbol of we can recognize in in this society in Italian abroad thank you thank you thank you very much I now invite uh, Simona Sprefico to represent il circolo and to say a few words about this and about also the science award that il circolo award uh, Il Circolo is an Italian cultural association and is established in 1995, so it's 27 years that we are uh, in the UK. Uh, we are doing a lot of work for uh, culture, so we promote the, uh, the Italian culture in the UK uh, with events. Uh, lately we organize a Circolo Giovani, so we are focused on the, the young person. Uh, and we support them. We support with uh, scholarship and we support uh, even with events uh, for, for them. Um, um, we raise money and uh, we, uh, the funds that uh, we raised is uh, all for uh, scholarship awards like uh, Italy Made Me or for our awards. Uh, we, uh, during the pandemic in 2021, uh, we organized these uh, science, life science uh, awards uh, with uh, uh, Roberto Witz and Paolo Vinays uh, for uh, two awards of £2,000 for um, pandemic and climate change. So we have two prizes to give away today uh, with uh, the Italy Made Me as well. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so... I think probably Georgia Bocca got uh, stuck in the traffic, so I think we can uh, move on with the ceremony. So I invite um, the ambassador here, and then uh, I will call the names of the 
of a winners. So the first um, is uh, so Teresa, if you can come here. So the first uh, award is given to Sara Campinotti. If you can come over. Thank you. So Sara Campinotti has been given an Italy Made Me 2022 for in the life science categories for and the research that uh, she presented uh, that she will talk about. It's about decoding the niches study of the hematopoeic fatal liver and fibrotic adult liver niches using bioengineered 3D systems. So let me just give this to the ambassador. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to give uh, an award. I have no idea what you are doing in your life, but <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, the second award is to Miriam Scarpa. Miriam as uh, couldn't come, so she has sent a video that we will see afterward. But we have Serena uh, De Rossi here to collect it. So Miriam has been uh, given also an award in the life science categories from on uh, her research on phosphorylation dependent signaling of M1 muscarinic acetylchloride receptor provides neuroprotection against neurodegenerative diseases. So Dr. Londra London sponsored the prize. Uh, we are not here, so we'll, we'll proceed uh, with them. So. Perfect. So third award is in the physical and engineering category. Michele Wintai Mack is the winner for and the, the research he presented is about deterioration and cracking in reinforced concrete bridges. And I invite, uh, sorry, I invite here um, Eduardo Nogueira. Yeah, come over, please. This is, uh, So the fifth um, Italy Made Me Award is to Diego Panici. Oh, Panici. Diego, please come over with uh, Simona from uh, Spafico from Il Circolo. So Diego has been giving an award in the also the P category and the research he presented was about assessing debris induced score and hydrodynamic forces to bridge peers. So please come over. Okay, and now another prize given by Il Circolo to Giulia Tozzi. Giulia has been awarded a, a prize, the only prize in the social sciences and humanities on her research on narco deforestation, the environmental effects of coca cultivation. So, please. Okay, now two, the two awards, uh, Life Science Awards from uh, Il Circolo. So I'll, I'll read the names and then I'll... So the first one is to Anarita Botta for her work in infection and tropical disease 
at the University of Florence, Italy. These were different awards with different uh, uh, criteria, selection criteria were run earlier in the, actually last year, towards the, during the pandemic. I was involved when I was not yet scientific attaché. Actually, I didn't know I would come <laughs> and also play this role. So, but I was uh, in the, in the um, committee who chose the, 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 the people. So this is... <laughs> Perfect. So the final award is to Lorenzo Mangone. Lorenzo Mangone, who is uh, actually comes from where I used to work and is now working at Imperial, studying at Imperial College for his work on health co-benefits of climate change mitigation strategies. Perfect. Okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, okay, you see, all the, all the award winners here. And the sponsors, sponsors and award winners all here, say. Perfect. Okay. So, great. Um, now, I think it's, it would be, we thought it would be interesting to hear a bit about the story of this uh, uh, young scientist. So, thank you very much, Ambassador, for... For a long time, so don't, I mean... It would be a little bit nasty, but I will nothing against the people who is talking when I'm leaving. But uh, yeah, so we, no, we were very fortunate that we managed to to have uh, the ambassador here for at least one hour. So, what uh, I we thought is to give a floor to all these uh, winners to tell us a bit about their story and uh, their research. So, no slides, they will come up following that order. Uh, actually, we, I think uh, Miriam Scarpa has sent a video, so we will project the video at the end. So we will go through Campinotti, then Mac, Panici, Tozzi, Botta, Mangone, and then we will project the video of Miriam Scarpa. So I invite uh, Sara first to come over here, and uh, it's really up to you to say a few words and uh, what you want. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Good evening, everyone. I'm extremely grateful for the scientific committee of the Italian Embassy and to the David Iwenson Foundation for awarding me with this prize this year. I'm extremely honored and I'm very grateful to be here tonight to celebrate, especially at this wonderful location. Before I go much into detail, try to explain uh, what I do uh, every day in the laboratory, uh, I want to give a brief, a brief introduction about myself. 
I come from Arezzo, where I graduated a Liceo Socio Psicopedagogico. And at the end of my high school, I decided I wanted to do medicine as the first choice of my university. And as it happens for uh, many high school, school students that do uh, the medicine admission test, I failed. So I didn't get in and uh, I enrolled in biotechnology university at the uh, University of Bologna, but with the idea that I would try to enter medicine again the following year. However, March 1st, that academic year, my life completely changed. It was the first day I entered in a scientific laboratory. It was a particular laboratory of cell culture. And I was giving a plate with some cells and I was told to try to keep them alive, not to kill them, not to infect them with strange bacteria. And it was very tough, but I did it and I loved every single moment of it. To the point that I decided not to go back into medical school and complete my degree in biotechnology. After I completed my bachelor in Bologna, I left the city that I loved that much and I moved to Milan to do a master in pharmaceutical biotechnology. There I had the opportunity to do an Erasmus program and to go abroad to do my thesis. I went to the very north of Sweden, Umeå, so snow is familiar for me for that reason. And it was a wonderful experience that enriched me both personally and professionally. Towards the end of my master, I decided uh, I really loved science and I wanted to do a PhD. London was a very big dream of mine, and I wanted to try to study stem cell, which was a growing interest during my study. So I was extremely grateful when I was awarded a PhD studentship to join the laboratory of Professor Paula Bonfanti at UCL. There, my PhD was focused on human fetal pancreas development. But I was also very grateful to be involved in the main project in the laboratory, which was aiming to reconstruct a human thymus from stem cell and tissue engineering. We published our work at the end of 2020, and more work is ongoing in Professor Bonfanti laboratory, and hopefully one day an engineered thymus could be transplanted into patients. Uh, towards the end of my PhD, I, uh, I decided that thanks to the great uh, scientific environment I was exposed at UCL and at the Crick, where the lab moved uh, throughout my study, uh, that I wanted to continue with academic career and do a postdoc. Uh, so I joined the, pro the laboratory of Dr. Luca Orbani, that by the way is also an Italy made me uh, awardee a few years ago, at the Roger William Institute of Hepatology, which is an institute affiliated with King's College. And as soon as I started, I got immediately fascinated by the liver. The liver is one of the major organs of our bodies, it carries out more than 500 different functions. But what really strikes me about the liver is the fact that during development in the fetal life, the functions that the liver does are completely different from adult life. During the fetal life, the liver is the main site in which blood stem cells proliferate. And blood stem cells are very interesting because we use them in clinical practice to treat blood malignancies or other diseases. So potentially, if we can understand what makes blood stem cells to proliferate this much in the embryo, we could use them to produce cells in a dish in the laboratory to increase the cells that we can transplant into patients. So at the same time, while I'm interested in how this fetal living environment is this uh, particular, I'm also interested in how things can go wrong in the adult liver when disease occurs. And I don't know if you're aware, but liver disease is a serious problem of our day society. It kills more than 2 million per pe pe people per year, and is set to rise of more than 55% in the next 20 years. And despite we know a lot about the liver, we still don't have strategy to stop fibrosis, which is the scarring of the liver tissue that is the first step towards irreversible disease, like cancer, for example. So what we do in the lab to study the liver at any stage from development to disease is to create a bioengineer model. We do this by producing this scaffold, which are 3D structures that we create by a process called decellularization. So we remove all the cells from the tissue, and what we are left is this 3D structure that remains with the composition and the architecture of the original organ. And we can put cells back in and use them as models in the laboratory. So what I do in the lab is to create 3D models of liver tissue that would mimic the fibrosis, which is this first step in liver disease. 
By doing so, by combining the matrix, this scaffold that creates the backbone of the organ with the cell, we can investigate what potentially can go wrong and also test diseases, uh, novel therapeutic uh, approaches. Uh, thanks to Nana uh, Welcome Trust uh, Early Career Award that was awarded this summer, I will apply similar approach for the study of the fetal liver. I will study how the matrix, so the, uh, the backbone of protein composing the tissue, help the stem cell to proliferate. And then I will add the cells to study really every single signal that can help stem, blood stem cell in the fetal liver to proliferate. And I believe that with the knowledge I could gain, we could then apply what we learn from the embryo, from the fetal liver, into clinical practices and try to optimize the culture condition for expanding blood stem cells for, te for therapy. Because currently, we aren't unable to do so, limiting the number of people that can get a blood transplant. So that's uh, well, what my research is about. Again, I'm extremely thankful for this award today. And I'm thankful also to all my mentors uh, throughout the year, and in particular, my current supervisor, Luca Urbani, who is extremely supportive for my uh, career and was supportive of this application today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, best wishes for your career. So I invite now Michele Mack, please. Well, first of all, a big uh, thank you for, to the embassy, to the uh, Italian uh, Cultural Institute, to the Association of uh, Italian Scientists, and to the, all the sponsors, and Pirelli in particular, for this uh, uh, prestigious awards. I, I have to say it's... Um, I am obviously Italian, I'm from a small town in Sicily, and I have traveled a lot throughout my career as a student, as, a, as an engineer. So receiving this award from the Italian embassy is particularly, particularly meaningful for, for me, I'm sure for everyone here. So uh, my research is about reinforced concrete, and uh, I often get asked uh, by family and friends, why concrete? Why, why, what is it that is so interesting uh, about concrete that deserves uh, so much research and efforts? And I'll, uh, I often reply uh, in two different ways. The first one is that uh, concrete is the man-made material that we use the most worldwide. So it, it in itself is responsible for something between 5 and 8% of global CO2 emissions. So if you want to solve uh, climate change, if you have a real impact in society, and we've seen how uh, important infrastructure is uh, today, we really need to work on concrete. Uh, and the other thing is that it's extremely complicated. Uh, we still don't fully understand how it works. Um, and, uh, and this means that, again, if you want to challenge the status quo, if you, uh, if you want to improve society, there is great potential behind, behind uh, theories uh, for, for concrete, concrete design. In, um, the fact that we don't understand it means that when we try to predict the resistance of a, a structure or a building, we are not very accurate. And whenever we are not accurate, usually we have to make safe decisions, uh, which means that uh, we, we usually overuse materials. We, we, we are wasteful in the way we, uh, we, we assess and we, we build and we design bridges in particular because we have to be safe. Um, so what I've tried to do in, uh, during my PhD, what I'm doing now as a, as a postdoc in Cambridge, is develop more accurate uh, ways of assessing and designing structures. Uh, during my PhD, I developed this, uh, this, this approach that is based on the, the surface cracks. So when a bridge uh, ages over time and loses strength, so deteriorates, uh, it turns out that the cracks that we can measure on the outside tell us a lot about what's happening inside the concrete, about what we cannot see and what is usually difficult to predict. So by using that as a damage indicator, we can develop more accurate uh, tools, more accurate ways of predicting how strong a bridge is. And this is particularly powerful because nowadays we have a lot of techniques like uh, drones and sensors and monitors that can tell us a lot about a bridge. We, we can collect a lot of data, but without a theory, that translates this big amount of information into something meaningful, something that engineers and asset managers can use in practice. Uh, data in itself is, is, is interesting, but it's not particularly useful. So this is where my research sits. It's essentially trying to translate everything we can measure on a bridge into something we quantified 
in, in our models. Uh, another thing that, uh, that I found, that we found in my research and led to what I'm doing now, is that sometimes less, in, less is more. So sometimes uh, if you reduce the amount of material that a structure, concrete structure has, you can actually improve its performance. This is a bit counterintuitive and it's because concrete behaves in a different, in a strange way. Uh, but again, when we go back to, the, uh, to the, uh, the environmental agenda, this means that we can save material, uh, reduce safety risk, and improve the environmental performance of structures. It is very, very, very powerful. So with this, I conclude, and I thank you again for, uh, for this thank work. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michele, and uh, best wishes to you as well. Um, so I invite now Diego uh, Panici, Panici to talk about his work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. Ambassador, thank you. Um, Dr. Spirafico, thanks for the contribution. Uh, I'm really pleased and honored and flattered to be here for this award as all of the other awardees probably. Uh, as many have said, I come from a small town as well, uh, near Rome, and so being here tonight, yeah, it means a lot uh, because you see it is um, finally your career has achieved something important and uh, it's not just confined to that small town, that small village. Um, so what, I'm, what brought me here was starting from the small town, um, I wanted to join the university in Roma 3. Uh, and at, at that time, that was my only choice. Unlike other students, sometimes they choose uh, other courses, other degrees, other universities. That was my only choice. So quite recklessly, I will say, uh, I decided to put all my eggs in one basket. And you can imagine my, um, how amazed I was when I realized that actually I was admitted and was in the top 15 of the, uh, of the applicants that year. Um, and since then, I developed a strong interest in water, hydraulics, and hydraulic engineering. Uh, and uh, after being awarded both my undergrad and my master, I went into the industry for a few years. And despite enjoying it, because it was, uh, it was a brilliant job, I worked in uh, the northeast of Italy on the construction of the motorway A4 between uh, Venice and Trieste. Uh, but I still found that there was something missing uh, in my professional development. And in 2014, I found a PhD position in Southampton and decided to apply for it. And uh, this literally changed my life because uh, it was scary moving to another country, but for me it was the beginning of, um, of a new age for myself. Um, and I discovered a huge interest in water, but especially on this topic of debris. Now, when we say debris in English, it's a very bad word. It means something that is not good. Uh, but when we say debris in rivers, we mean trees, logs, plants uh, that are normally carried along the water. Uh, what happens is that these debris, they accumulate at bridge piers. Now, this is a serious problem because what they do, they exert significant forces to the bridge. And at the same time, they increase a phenomenon that we can't see from the surface, but we know it happens. Uh, at the foundation, which is scour. Scour is the erosion that happens at the foundation of a pier in which the uh, material underneath the foundation is uh, slowly removed, sometimes um, at a very fast rate. What can happen is that the bridge can be damaged and can collapse. Uh, and this is the major cause of bridge collapses around the world. Uh, and debris, when they're involved in this process, they can be the cause of bridge collapse of up to a third. So it's a very compelling problem that we see every year that has some consequences. So what my research was at the beginning as my PhD was to study how these debris formation form. So I carried out a series of experiments, nearly a thousand, uh, in the laboratory at the University of Southampton. And I was able to find out what were the uh, relationships in which these debris accumulation formed. So uh, they follow certain phases. But what was really interesting was that I was able to find out what the maximum size of this debris accumulation was and that by a simple equation, we can estimate the maximum size that we can expect at the bridge pier. 
but this wasn't the end of it because when I started my postdoc after my PhD at the University of Exeter, there was already a project ongoing about how these debris accumulation affect the scour at bridge piers. So there was a perfect match between my previous research and ongoing research. And over the last three years, we were able to develop uh, equations in which we can estimate the amount of scour that is due to debris accumulations. And you'd be quite surprised that it can be double the scour there will be without debris accumulations. Um, the upshot of this is that now we're able to use this methodology uh, not only in academia, so that is something that is uh, within the academic community, but it's also included within the Highways England, or better now called the National Highways, the manual on SCAWA, and also has been adopted by uh, Syria, which is a UK leading uh, company for manuals on um, hydraulic and non-hydraulic engineering. Uh, and the future prospect is that we're working with uh, Network Rail, so they will adopt it for the uh, railway bridges as well. And we are in talks with a consortium of other Italian universities, uh, which include Polytechnic in Milano, University of Florence, etc., which it may see the inclusion of this research within the Italian practice in the next few years. And um, thank you very much again. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes to you as well. The future, and then now I invite uh, Julia Tozzi, please. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to receive this award. It's uh, very special to me that it comes from the Embassy of Italy because my first uh, international work experience was at the Italian Embassy in Washington, D.C. four years ago during my master. So it's a big honor for me that it comes uh, right from the Embassy. So I'm a second year PhD student in economics at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, during my studies, I, I, I hold a bachelor degree in economics from the University of Padova, a master degree in economics from the University of Bologna, and during my studies, I also studied in Munich and in Marseille. I also conducted the internship at the Italian Embassy in DC, and uh, between my studies and my PhD, I worked two years as a research officer at the University of Zurich for the chair of Joachim Bott in political economy and economic history. So now I'm studying a particular type of deforestation. So we all know, we, we saw before in the last panel that uh, forests have a key role in the fight of climate change. And between the year 2000 and 2018, approximately 8% of the Amazon forest has been deforested. Now the Amazon is emitting more carbon than it's able to absorb and its CO2 emissions are comparable to the one of Japan. So understanding the causes of deforestation is a major policy issue. And as such, that's, uh, it has been at the center of the attention on last COP26 and COP27. So I follow the interdisciplinary literature coming from, mostly from geography and bioscience that is trying to provide increasing qualitative and quantitative evidence that criminal activities associated with drug trafficking and cultivation are among the main drivers of forest loss in the American continent. However, while there are studies that prove that cocaine trafficking is providing a lot of uh, damages to the environment in Central America, there are no specific studies that analyze the role of illicit drug cultivation on deforestation. And that is what I do in my paper. I study how the expansion of illicit crops uh, impacts deforestation level in Peru. So I focus on coca because cocaine is the most used illicit stimulant in Europe and its cultivation in Peru, which does not only host the second largest portion of the Amazon forest, but also about one fourth of the global area under coca bush cultivation. And in order to do so, I, I transform Peru into a grid and I, um, I look at cells of 12 by 12 kilometers and I chase these cells over time from the year 2003 to the year 2019. And I built a unique data set that mostly rely on early satellite images and geographical raster data. So I have satellite images coming from the NASA, from the bodies instrument above the NASA satellite Terra for uh, uh, the three cover levels. Also, I have uh, data, georeference data on coca, coca bushes uh, granted to me by the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime and the government of Peru. So I'm able to georeference geo where coca bushes are located in Peru, but also in Colombia and in Bolivia. And uh, 
in my empirical analysis, I exploit the fact that uh, there are some areas that are more prone to Cocoga, either because they are more suitable or because they are closer to the frontier with Colombia. Because narcos uh, respond to anti-drug policies in one country by moving to the next country. And uh, we know that Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru are the only countries in the world that have the optimal condition to grow coca. And therefore, in my, my, what I find, it's still a work in progress, but I find that uh, one more percent of coca density leads to a reduction in till cover of about 26 percentage points, which is a huge estimate. I'm trying to understand what are the drivers and the mechanisms behind these uh, uh, very high results. So the paper has a strong policy implication because I show that cover cultivation has serious negative effects on the environment and I only take into consideration the forest loss dimension. There is also the biodiversity dimension, the pollution of waters because of chemicals, and of course the socioeconomic dimension because uh, of uh, people who are the victims of these phenomenon. Um, in addition, a similar conclusion might be derived in other contexts, cultivation of uh, opium poppy in Myanmar or on the, on the same Andean countries, a cultivation on, uh, of uh, cannabis in Northern America. So in general, I'm an applied microeconomist and I'm interested in every research question that, is, that has a strong policy relevance and what I hope for my present and my future work to have a real impact with my research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and congratulations again and best wishes to you as well. So now I invite uh, Annarita Botta. Thank you again uh, for the word. I am an infectious disease uh, doctor uh, now working uh, in a university hospital in Naples, Italy. Uh, and uh, my daily activities and the research um, deals about uh, tropical disease and uh, in particular tuberculosis, which is a disease that uh, many of us uh, think disappeared, but uh, it is actually between us. Uh, my academic background uh, passes through the Vita Salute San Raffaele Hospital in Milan, which is an institute of great excellence and uh, scientific uh, importance, and the Troy University of Florence. Indeed, uh, just one year ago, I achieved the specialty certificate in infectious and tropical disease. Uh, and uh, during my years in the uh, University of Florence, uh, I, we conducted a lot of research regarding uh, tropical disease, in particular the screening of migrants uh, for uh, tropical neglected disease, uh, such as uh, schistosomiasis and uh, strongyloidosis, where we found that when a program of screening in migrants we come to our country is implemented, uh, we can both save money and lives uh, for the, the national the NHS uh, in an Italian perspective. Um, obviously, as an infectious disease uh, uh, doctor, I have uh, witnessed the, the disruptive impact of a COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, during uh, these years, I felt I've been called to make a um, scientific contribution to, do, to, the, to the scientific research uh, in order to explore as many things as possible um, of this new viral disease. And uh, for uh, me and uh, another association of uh, Italian students, we conducted uh, a systematic review where we found that the impact of a COVID-19 pandemic to healthcare provision to non-COVID patients was really disruptive and that the, our national health system should be more ready and prepared in order to uh, face uh, other new pandemic scenarios. Uh, finally, I want to talk about a project that the Circolo support, uh, supported with uh, the help of a um, uh, professor of Imperial College of London. Uh, this uh, project regards the team of the One Health, uh, which is an approach based on the concept that the human health is uh, strictly interconnected with uh, the life, with the the help of plants, animals, and the environment. Indeed, we decided to explore uh, the rule of the antiviruses, which are uh, rodent-borne viruses, and uh, we, we, uh, we found that the deforestation, the, the um, urban development, and, uh, for example, agriculture are human anthropogenic factors that really impact on the emergence of these new uh, virus, which we, we, uh, these uh, antiviruses are the potential to become a new pandemic uh, 
create a new pandemic scenarios. Uh, so uh, thank you again, and I hope that in the future um, we, we can uh, benefit more and more from the diplomatic impact of the science in order to share my uh, knowledge and to expand uh, my knowledge about public health and uh, tropical disease with the several distribution in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marisa. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, now I want to invite uh, Lorenzo Mangone, please, to present yourself. Hello, everyone. I wanted to follow all the previous winners in thanking the Embassy, ICE UK, and the Circolo specifically, for, specifically for the award and the opportunity that uh, it gave me that has truly marked a pivotal moment in my research career. Like Anrita, I'm also a medical doctor, but uh, I, have a, I had a very different uh, career path because I decided from the get-go that what I actually wanted to do, at least in the early stages of my career, was research. So I became a student at uh, Sant'Anna School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, uh, where I initially focused on neuroscience until COVID came. COVID gave me, disrupted a little bit my plans, but also gave me a lot of time to reflect on my priorities and what I actually wanted to do, and made me realize that what was my personal project of passion, that is the fight against climate change, could be folded into my professional, professional uh, life, my, could become part of my research. And I decided to focus my research on the co-benefits of climate change mitigation because I wanted to uh, focus on a, something that was a little more proactive than just describing the awful impact that climate change is going to have on health. Uh, the topic of co-benefits of climate change mitigation is centered on finding what are actually the beneficial effects of climate, finding, fighting climate change on other aspects, specifically given my background on health. So uh, thanks to the Circular Science Award, I was able to come to London last year for three months, and I work with Professor Vines at uh, Imperial College on the impact of diet. So we know that diet is responsible for at least one third of the anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, especially due to land use changes. And what I wanted to study was if adopting a diet that is more sustainable and that is defined by some guidelines that were provided by the Eat Lancet Committee. Lancet is one of the greatest science journals uh, and they developed some guidelines for um, a diet that is actually at least at the least possible damaging for the planet. Uh, my research question was, is this diet also going to have any sort of uh, positive impact on uh, overall mortality and cancer incidence? we were able to demonstrate that uh, indeed a uh, sustainable diet is, al is also a healthy diet. We presented some of these results to the uh, Istituto Superiore di Sanità in Italy in a specific uh, report last year, and we also just recently published them on uh, Epidemiologia e Prevenzione. And from this single experience, I decided that I also wanted to do a PhD on these subjects. So I just started a PhD a couple of months ago here at Imperial, where I'm developing new indexes to measure the impact of uh, sustainable diet on health, uh, more specifically if, on the efficiency, uh, nutritional and energetical efficiency on diet regarding to greenhouse gas emission, land use, water use, and try to develop also, uh, I have access to about half a million uh, uh, subjects all across Europe, and we are trying to characterize the diets of all the different European countries uh, according to the emission that they require and the positive or negative health uh, impacts that they have. So thank you very much for uh, everything. Thank you, Lorenzo. Good evening, everyone. Buonasera a tutti. My name is Miriam Scarpa. I'm very sorry I'm not able to attend this event in person today, as I'm currently in Sweden. But as my proxy, there is my dear friend from my hometown, Venice, Serena De Rossi. It's an honor for me to receive this award, and I'm very grateful to the Italian Embassy, the Association of Italian Scientists in the UK, and Institute of Italian Culture, who have organized the great initiative, which is Italy Made Me, and also this event. 
And of course, I would like to thank thank all the sponsors that promoted this award and this event. With a special thank you to Dr. London, who sponsored my prize. I was asked to introduce a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in Venice, specifically in Lido, Venice, or Lido di Venezia. And for who's not familiar, it's mainly famous for the International Film Festival that happens every year in September, and also the seaside. I underwent all mandatory education after I was um, about 18 years old in Venice and I moved to Scotland in 2013 where I've completed my Bachelor of Sciences in Molecular and Cellular Biology with Biotechnology at University of Glasgow. Then I decided to stay at University of Glasgow to pursue or rather start my career in academic research with a PhD. And the research work I've conducted during my PhD is what I was awarded for by Italy Made Me. So I'll try and summarize the findings from my PhD research work. And it might be a little bit complicated as it's pharmacology and it's neuroscience. And so it might, it's a, diff a bit difficult to explain with slides, but uh, so please bear with me. My PhD project at the University of Glasgow aimed to understand how drugs for Alzheimer's disease could work not only to improve symptoms, but also to slow down or stop the underlying disease. There are no medications that currently can slow down or stop Alzheimer's disease, and the current therapies that are available can only ameliorate the symptoms, and they stop working after the disease has progressed past a certain stage. There is a protein, however, in the brain, specifically the, um, the M1 muscarinic receptor protein, that has an important role in memory. But its activation, importantly, has also shown to be able to slow down disease in animal models of Alzheimer's. So this is very exciting and promising. However, when we activate this receptor, uh, so the M1 receptor, we know uh, that sometimes can cause some adverse reactions, such as seizures, for example. And this is due to the receptor being able to initiate at least two different signaling cascades. So the questions for my PhD project was, which one of these signaling cascades is good? Which one is, is the one that will be able to slow down disease progression and be protective for the, in the brain? So we know that the M1 receptor, when it's activated, it can send signals for two different signaling cascades. So, and I, as an example, have this plug. So if this one is the M1 receptor, we know it can charge or it can it can send signals through two different pathways. Okay. However, when it, uh, certain drugs may activate the receptor in a way that it prefers to activate one pathway over another one. So for example, my, if when it's activated by certain drugs, maybe this pathway is more activated than this one. So this, this will be charging more than this one. So in my project, I want to find out which one of these pathways can be protective in the brain. So in Glasgow, we had a mouse model that has a mutant version of the M1 receptor that is not, ab is not able to send signal through one of the pathways. So one, one of the pathways signal is removed. And I'm going to be a little bit technical here. So what we removed is the phosphorylation pathway. Um, so then we had some mice uh, that that had the normal M1 receptor and others that had the mutant, this mutant M1 receptor. And these mice were infected with prion disease, which uh, is the same as the mad cow disease that many of you might know. So this disease has very similar characteristics to Alzheimer's disease and is caused by the buildups of uh, proteins that are toxic to the brain. Also, um, it's characterized by inflammation in the brain and it manifests with memory symptoms. With my research, I found that mice with the mutant M1 receptor had significantly accelerated, so worse, disease progression compared to the, the corresponding normal mice with disease. So they had these mice with the mutant M1 receptor had higher buildup of toxic proteins, higher inflammation, and also the symptoms manifested earlier than in normal mice with the disease. 
So this is very important because it suggests that the signaling pathway that was removed from the mutant mouse, so the phosphorylation pathway, has protective mechanisms in the brain that are able to slow down disease. So this was a very exciting discovery for me and the lab, as um, this suggested that medicines that ensure the activation of the phosphorylation pathway will more likely help to slow down disease. Importantly to know is that this study was on mice and uh, with prion disease, but we found a lot of similarities between the mouse model or this mouse model and Alzheimer's disease. So this protective mechanism of the NY receptor is potentially true in human diseases too, such as Alzheimer's. I hope this was clear to everyone and I'm happy to answer any questions or curiosity you might have offline. Now, I've recently relocated in Stockholm in Sweden, where I've started my postdoctoral studies at the Karolinska Institute. My research now focuses on biomarkers of not only Alzheimer's disease, but other neurodegenerative conditions such as progressive supranuclear palsy or, car uh, or cortical basal um, degeneration. They are also caused by the buildup of toxic proteins in the brain. However, my research now is on human samples and not more in mice. And the main goal of my, of my research is to find a way to detect disease as early as possible using imaging methods such as PET scanning. So this is me, and thanks again to all the organizers, the sponsors, and of course the audience. And I would like, I really wish I could be there, and I hope everyone had a lovely evening and, uh, and had a lovely, a lovely day. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. So we are at the end of a long day, so I invite maybe... Carla, Carla, what do you want to say? A couple of words from the Isaac point of view and then Katya to close. So first Carla and then Katya. And thank you very much to all of you for having been here. Congratulations to all the winners and also to all the people that have participated uh, and uh, sent uh, their applications. Uh, we, uh, um, they couldn't all be winners, but uh, there have been some great science presented today and also submitted uh, for the awards. And uh, yeah, keep on with the good science, both uh, in the UK, in Italy and uh, everywhere um, you will uh, actually end up uh, in the future. Well, it's just a really great pleasure to host this uh, incredible evening. And the best thing is to see so much Italian young talent out there in the sciences, and it really bo bodes so well for the future. And you don't know how heartwarming it is for all of us to see so much talent and you know such such great promise in you so well done thank you very much and thank you the embassy Isaac and all the sponsors and everybody who's come tonight and I think we can invite everyone to join us upstairs for a glass of wine and the celebrations will continue thank you Grazie.